right. Well, I uh, want to thank everybody for coming out today. Um, it's our first annual True Earth Regenerative Farming event. And uh, we're very happy to have True Earth and Claude. Glad you guys could come be with us today. Um, I want to say just a little bit. I, I, I've wanted to do well, we have been certified as organic farming now for the last five, five, six years. And, but it was only in the last year that I think I developed the vocabulary around regenerative farming um, to really understand and understand that as well as permaculture to be able to start really utilizing that, um, that method. And a lot of that has to do with True Earth and Claude and, and those guys. Um, I actually went to, I had the idea for this symposium by going over and talking to them and, um, and they had a guy there that specializes in permaculture and Ryan's going to give us a, our second talk, which is on permaculture today. So it's really the, uh, the, uh, religion that we've grasped hold to, uh, as far as trying to, um, uh, trying, uh, to promote that particular type of agriculture. And that's why all y'all are here. And then, so part of that, though, we think is utilization and protection of our waterways. And so our very first talk is Gordon Rogers with the Flint River Keeper. And Gordon um, has a great talk prepared for us today. And uh, I'll let him get started. So thank you. I appreciate it, Trip, and I appreciate the folks at True Earth, and appreciate all y'all being here. Um, I have, since we're since we're talking about a new religion here, I have some confessions to make. Um, I am not an expert on regenerative ag. Um, I'm not an expert on ag of any sort. Um, I'm still learning about that, and you can't be a river keeper in the Flint River uh, without learning a lot about ag, uh, uh, particularly in the, the middle and more specifically in the lower portions of the Flint, ag is the economy. There is no other economy besides ag. And it also happens to be, uh, particularly when you combine it with forestry, um, the largest industry in the state of Georgia. And so when you're talking about the impacts for jobs, water, employment, et cetera, in Georgia, uh, and particularly in the Lower Flint, you're talking about ag. So I have had a lot of OJT uh, about ag, but I, I am no expert. I'm an, I am an expert on re helping restore things. And uh, I think that restorative and regenerative are probably more or less interchangeable words. And I have had the privilege of working with people like Tripp and Will Harris and others to learn about what regenerative ag might mean. Um, and I think it's probably something that's still being invented, but it also has a long history uh, in terms of the literature on it and the philosophical underpinnings of it and the, the practicalities of it. There's, a, there's quite a literature on it in the, pop, in, the, in the popular literature and in the, uh, the scientific literature. So it, it really is humbling and an honor to be the first speaker. He, he called me on, on the telephone. He told me I was the key, key, keynote speaker. I'm thinking like, ah, that's, that's stretching it a little bit. <laughs> But I'll try to hit a note, whether it's the keynote or not, that uh, helps set up the rest of the day. And I applaud uh, Tripp and Claude for, for putting, putting this thing on. And uh, I have a feeling that uh, two to five years from now, um, no tent this size is going to hold the crowd that'll, that'll come to this thing. So thank, thank you all for being here. Um, I've been doing a lot of thinking about the topic because I was forced to, uh, but not the topic of water, but the topic of regenerative ag over the last two or three weeks, um, even though I was given a heads up, you know, probably three months ago, I hadn't really been thinking about it in terms of this talk, 
but for two or three weeks. And then a whole lot of thought since 10 o'clock this morning on the drive down from Talbot County. And, um, and here's what I've come up with. Uh, I'm going to um, just kind of lay out what I think uh, regenerative ag looks like in southwest Georgia and southern Georgia more generally at the moment. And then I want to talk about the role of ag in water use and in water conservation. And, and hopefully that'll tee up some thinking and some um, conversation for Q&A and for the rest of the day. Um, I see ag at the moment falling into three categories, and two of them are, are regenerative, uh, at least in terms of the rudiments of them um, in, in their own way. One of them is not. Um, there is a huge and growing movement in Georgia nationwide uh, in, in organic ag, you know, like true organic ag that is, that is seeking to regenerate um, soils and soil quality, um, production methods in terms of, uh, uh, I'm just going to call it economic justice, uh, in terms of employment opportunities and uh, also communities, because as ag has become more corporate, uh, ag communities have become more fractured. Uh, river keepers are frequently in the business of naming names. Um, so I'm gonna name one, I'm gonna call somebody out. Uh, last year at a symposium for dairymen up in Wisconsin, then Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, told that group of people who were basically hanging on by their claws, go big or get out. Basically, he said, there's no place for medium and small dairymen in today's economic structure. And when you look at um, certain federal policies and certain state policies, it's easy to come to that conclusion. And when you look at some of the language of National and State Farm Bureau, uh, organizations. It's easy to come to that conclusion. And when you look at some of the legislative work that is afoot uh, in, in state legislatures and at the, um, at the federal level, it's easy to come to the conclusion that there's no place for medium and small operators uh, in this country uh, viewed through a certain lens. I disagree. I think that the future of ag is in medium and small farms. Uh, and the reason I think so is because they're sustainable and truly big ag is not. Truly big ag is not sustainable because A, it's not, it's not, it's, it, it is subsidized. So like big oil, big nuke, big anything, it really can't make it without federal subsidies and that in itself is not sustainable. And the other reason it's not sustainable is it frequently mines the soil and mines community. And by that, I mean just like a, just like a, a coal mine or, a, or a, a, an aluminum mine or what have you. It literally extracts resources from the ground and from the community, converts them to cash, and at some point moves on. Um, you may or may not have heard of the Anaconda Copper Company. Google it up at some point. Great name for a large corporation. Anaconda just squeezes the life out of stuff. It's currently based in the American Southwest. Uh, it used to be the Dodge Land and Timber Company in Dodge County, Georgia. The stream of capital that became the Anaconda Copper Company, now a mineral extraction company, extracted the life out of Dodge County, Georgia, and a few surrounding counties like Wilcox, Telfair, and others. Uh, in the heyday of the big cut down of longleaf pine, they, they extracted that resource and moved on. And in the process, they wrecked the local community and the economy. If you go try to buy land in Dodge County, Georgia today, you will frequently have a hard time getting clear title because they purposely messed up all the land titles as, as they were moving through families that were under stress and, uh, and doing uh, forced sales. 
And that, that is the nature of big anything. Now, I'm not a communist. I'm not a socialist. I'm a capitalist, uh, personally. And so I'm not putting down uh, making money. What I am putting down is making money when it's extractive, when it's uh, not uh, involving the community at a level to where if the corporation elects to move on, that uh, there's something left, that there's still a community there. So that's my definition of regenerative ag. And it doesn't have to be small, uh, but it probably does have to be medium. So we're seeing in Georgia the organic movement, which is becoming, um, some of them, medium. Trip, you may or may not know, you'll be surprised maybe to know that at a recent committee hearing in Atlanta on hemp, you were, you were characterized as big hemp. Uh, yeah, Pretoria Fields was literally called out as being a big player and I can't compete with them. That was testimony. Of a, of a young lady, and I, I got a chuckle when I heard that, because um, I figured you would. Yeah. Um, um, really what you're moving into is being medium, you know, at, 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 in my estimation sure. at, at this point. Um, so I believe that we're seeing that happen. I also think that there's this other category, the second category of ag in Georgia, which is traditional row crop, uh, cattle, dairy, orchard, meaning blueberries and pecans primarily, um, that's medium in its nature. I call them mom and pop millionaires because most of the, most of the, uh, uh, the true po, po farmers are gone. Okay, they, they've been weeded out a long time ago. So these are people that own several hundred acres to several thousand acres and they're doing what we think of as, you know, the traditional crops, cotton, corn and peanuts. Um, blueberries, pecans, and grain sorghum, and, and, and some other crops. That are, you know, everything else is kind of below those. And they're using center pivot ag. Um, they're using a fair amount of chemicals. They're using uh, uh, a, a, a lot of fertilizer, a fair amount of herbicides and pesticides. But they are also trending into regeneration. Uh, they're not the enemy per se. They have sunk a lot of money into particularly water efficiency um, with, with their center pivot equipment. And as you get more efficient with water, even if you're not trying, you get more efficient with the other things because it's not washed off as frequently. It's just physics. Um, and they're also continuously driven by the market to get more efficient with their other inputs because they're trying to preserve their margins. And so what I call the mom and pop millionaires or the, the medium size operations and maybe even big row crop is um, in the camp for me, if not actually in regenerative ag at the moment, at least they're candidates for it because there are plenty of crop choice, soil management, water management options out there to where those folks can continue and sustain those operations and still be here at least as a family corporation um, two, three, four generations from now. So that's, that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. But there's this third category that's extractive, like the Dodge Land Company was. And those folks literally trash the land and move on. And some of them at the moment, we don't know exactly who they are. Um, Bill Gates has bought up, and his corporations have bought up a bunch of land in South Georgia. It remains to be seen how they're going to manage that land. But CAFOs, con confined animal feeding operations, certainly fall into the category of extractive because they are so burdening the land and the water um, with nutrients and pathogens that they are literally forced to buy more land to, um, to put their waste on, and eventually they have to move on. Now, we're dealing with a situation that Tripp knows very well uh, up in Sumter County um, around Smithville. You've driven right through the middle of it. I'm sure y'all have right now where 
there's a very, very large CAFO that is fracturing that community. They're literally shattering people's lives, their neighbors, and trashing three creeks that have names. Bear Branch, Muckaloochee, and the Muckalee itself. Um, and so from a riverkeeper standpoint, that's bad. And even if it were not bad ag, We'd, we'd still be fighting it, you know, even if it weren't in that category. But I'm, I'm putting that in the category of extractive, which is get in there, buy up some assets, extract all you can from it, and move on, just like a strip mine. And that, that is the history of CAFOs. So we know that CAFOs are bad. I know, and you may have to come to your own knowledge, that Sonny Perdue was wrong uh, when he told those dairymen in Wisconsin to get big or get out. Uh, I, that's, that's bad farm policy. That's bad human policy. And it's certainly bad water policy. And I'm going to stop right there and do a time check. What, how much? You're good. Am I? Okay. So let me talk about the Flint just a little bit. I can do this in five minutes. <laughs> I'll pretend like I'm stuck on an elevator with somebody that don't want to listen to me <laughs> at the Capitol. Uh, When I got hired, I was immediately approached, back channel and to my face, please don't sue the farmers. Because the thought was, as soon as there was a river keeper in southwest Georgia, that we were going to crank up the Endangered Species Act, based on mussels primarily, in Itchaway, Notchaway Creek, Kinchafuni, and Spring Creek, that we were going to crank up that machine and sue the farmers over extractive use of water and just go after them with a federal lawsuit. We didn't do it. Instead, we're working with farmers, and I'm going to come back to that in my last 30 seconds. Um, and here's why we didn't do it. I'm going to exaggerate here just a little bit. 30 minutes after you file an Endangered Species Act suit against anybody, it is that group of people against critters. That, that's how the press deals with it. Even if it's not true, and, and it wasn't true in the snail darter case. I don't know how many of you have the snail darter case pounded into your mind. Rush Limbaugh used that one all the time, God rest his soul. Uh, in the snail darter case, it was trout unlimited right-wingers, trout fishermen very wealthy people, most of them, that were using the Endangered Species Act to try to protect some, their trout streams from being inundated by the Teleco Dam. They used the tool they had to try to stop the dam so they could preserve their trout fishing. That's an interesting fact. Rush never told anybody that on the radio. And they won the case, and then Congress changed the law. So the Endangered Species Act got weaker immediately. So that's reason number two. The Endangered Species Act ain't what everybody thinks it is. And because it's not what everybody thinks it is, we would have gotten an extremely limited win. We probably would have won because the Jones Center in Baker County has an excellent data set on mussels in those creeks. But we probably would have got a remedy for only Spring Creek and only Itchaway Notchaway Creek. Those were the only, the, that's probably what the federal judge would have handed down for us. And it would have been a flow that would be like having somebody on a ventilator in ICU. It would have been a flow that just kept muscles alive. And that's all. And we're after flows that are bigger than that. We're after flows that you can have a baptism in, that you can swim in, and that you can paddle and snorkel in. That's what we're after. So what's going on in the lower Flint is that we have the miracle of the Florida aquifer, the true heavenly gift of the Florida aquifer that's probably sustainable. Uh, even if we were to take all the quail plantation acreage and put it into center pivot, which is the only acreage that's left in southwest Georgia is the quail plantation acreage. The Florida aquifer would probably still be there as a major water resource, even at the end of a four-year drought. 
and we haven't had a four-year drought in hundreds of years. We hadn't had a four-year drought in southwest Georgia long enough to go to where we can only see it in the records of tree rings. That's the only place we can see it. All the recent droughts are three, have been two and a half and three-year droughts. And there's plenty of water in the Florida aquifer, even at the end of those droughts, so that we can have sustainable center pivot row crop and orchard ag from a water standpoint. The problem is that the top of the aquifer is drawn down far enough to where the creeks go dry. Spring Creek goes completely dry. Itchaway Notchaway Creek got down to within two percentage points of its normal drought flow of going dry in 11 and 12. Um, and the river itself, its base flow was cut in half. At Bainbridge, it went from the old days of 2,000 cubic feet per second down to 1,000. This is what Florida's griping about, by the way. They, have, they do have a legitimate gripe. Uh, and at Newton, it went down from about 12 or 1,300 down to about 625. I'm talking about cubic feet per second. So the river's flow got cut in half, and some of these major tributaries went, went dry or almost so. Bless you. Um, and so what's important about that is that the farmers themselves notice that. They place value on the river too. They're part of this community. They like to take their kids on those creeks and fish and swim too. So th there's a tiger eating its tail here and everybody knows it. And what's important is not whether or not row crop ag in South Georgia is sustainable but whether we can regenerate a healthy flow in those creeks. And so as we're thinking about the soil and the community and job opportunities, et cetera, we need to be thinking about the whole culture. You know, what's, what is it about Southwest Georgia or Georgia anywhere that, that's important to you? And part of it's probably a creek or a river somewhere. There's a spring and a wood duck swamp where I swam and hunted wood ducks in Wilcox County when I was a boy, a teenager, and in my 20s. That spring don't flow no more in the summertime. And that wood duck swamp only has water in it about two out of 10 years anymore, and I gave up my lease. Family lease, it, we'd been leasing that land since the 1940s to, to go duck hunting. That's a thing of the past. But in both cases, that spring and that wood duck swamp, they could come back. With, with more efficiency in ag. And I think I'll just close my comments there and, uh, and take a few questions. So besides supporting the Flint River Keepers, and everybody please join there, join in- www.flintriverkeeper.org. Membership drive, right. Uh, keep right there. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> what individually can we do uh, to help support those folks? So, I mean, not, not corporately, not there, but what, what individually do we need to be doing at your home, do everything you can to reduce water use and uh, electrical use. Because when you're using electricity, you're typically burning water somewhere. Might not be in the Flint River. It might be over on the Savannah River at the Nuke plant or up on, over on the Altmulgee River at Plant Share. But, you know, dial back your electrical use, dial back your water use. Do the same thing at your business. If you're a farmer, you've got a big thumbprint. But uh, every business, every small, medium, and large manufacturing outfit has a water thumb or footprint of some sort. Um, you don't have to write a check to Flint Riverkeeper to participate in what we do. Go to our website and sign up for our emails or follow us on social media, and you'll see lots of opportunities to weigh in at the county, state, or federal level on, on water issues. And by weighing in, I mean picking up the telephone and dialing your elected official and tell them what you do or don't want, you know, on a particular piece of legislation. Um, and spread the word of hope. All is not lost. There, there are some things going on on this planet that we may have pushed too far, maybe. That's, that's a conversation for a different symposium. <laughs> But we can hedge against that 
and we can restore flow and restore soil health. Uh, um, we, we, can, we can steward what we have and what's within our control. So spread the word of, of hope. Don't, don't be like my kids were when they were 18, 19, 20 years old. They've kind of gotten past that extreme cynicism of, I'm just going to drink a bunch of beer because there's nothing I can do about it. You know? <laughs> They've kind of gotten past that and gotten into, you know what? I think I can do something about this with my friends and my family, et cetera. So don't, don't ever lose hope. Great question. Thank you. So with your uh, creek and your duck hole drying up, what practices do you think is contributing to that the most? Forestry, row crops? Uh... That's over in that part of the world is center pivots. Um, in, in, my, in my old duck lease, and I'd be trespassing if I went there now, I walked the whole thing one day when it was bone dry, and I had been warned by my uncle that if I went in a certain part of it, uh, this is as a 13, 14 year old, don't go there, you're going to float your hat. Um, so I went there when it was bone dry, and I realized, whoops, this is a little bit like Yellowstone. If you go too close to uh, the vent, you might fall through, and in Yellowstone, you're going to get cooked if you do that. Over there, it, it's, a, it's, a lime, it's, a, it's a hole on the way to becoming a limestone sink, and there's places where there are limestone sinks all over that property, just like around here. And I could hear the water running down in the ground, through, through the, and there's a, there was a hole. So what, what happens is that seasonally, there and here, central south Georgia, deep central south Georgia and southwest Georgia, uh, spring sweet corn goes in, the pumping starts, the aquifer top starts dropping. And you can see, you can see it in, in the well meters and you can see it in the, in the creek meters, you know, the, the stations. And it drops way more rapidly and way lower than it did, you know, before all this center pivot was here. So that sounds like I'm preaching against center pivot when I say that. And what I'm really preaching against is 1970s center pivot because the technology now has advanced far enough to where uh, we can recover partially by not pulling it down as far with better software, better hardware, um, and um, more fine-tuned crop choice. There are some other steps that can probably be taken because we have aquifers underneath the floor dam that are productive, but they're more expensive to sink wells into and to pull. Um, it's like s sucking a well-frozen daiquiri through a straw um, from, the, from the sand aquifers. Uh, uh, that may take some subsidies, but if we're gonna subsidize in, almost anything you can name in America, <laughs> you know, why wouldn't we subsidize efficient water use? So uh, I, I see technologies and practices on the horizon that maybe not for me, even though I was hoping that my grandchildren would hunt ducks in that swamp, um, but maybe for somebody else that uh, that would be sustainable at some point. Yes, sir. So I, I, the last time I even uh, looked into the aquifer was probably eight, nine years ago, and I remember it was way down. What is the current level of the aquifer? That's what's so wonderful about the Florida aquifer here in southwest Georgia. It's completely recharged today. It is, it is a sustainable resource. It's not like you're pulling from it and it's a static bank account with no interest. It doesn't just go lower and lower and lower. When we get back into a wet cycle, like right now, that gum thing's completely full. Um, the number I'm remembering for some wells around Newton was 65 foot below normal. The, the amount of water in that aquifer is measured in cubic miles, cubic miles of water. And so the problem is not that we're putting our um, ag economic future in jeopardy, the problem's at the margin up top. You're just pulling it down far enough to where the river and the creeks are in trouble and it causes all kinds of problems down in Florida. I mean, I'd love to pretend that the beach is at Bainbridge, but it's not. 
and we, we, we do have some responsibility for folks downstream. Great question. Yes, ma'am. So if the aquifer is 100% full, what would it take for your spring and your wood duck property to come back? Well, it's fine at the moment. Springs are flowing. Wood duck property is fine this year. The problem is always in the drought years. That's, that's, that's the problem. And if you think about what we've lost in terms of 100%, the hydrologists, plural, that I'm talking to at the Jones Center, Auburn, Georgia Tech, elsewhere, tell me that if we could recover about 20 to 30% of what we've lost, which is very doable, then we would be in pretty good shape in, in terms of creek flows and swamp levels so these are these are achievable things and we're already working on it we're in a project right now to restore the flow in radium springs i'm talking about during a drought radium springs is flowing today the issues during a drought um, and we're on, involved in a bunch of projects on the upper flint which have nothing to do with ag and everything to do with atlanta uh, yeah atlanta uh, well Atlanta's the boogeyman, right? Yeah, yeah, and they're upstream of us. But the problem in Itchaway Notchaway Creek has zero to do with Atlanta, other than Atlanta's a market, not for water, but for food and fiber. The problems in the Upper Flint, where I live, have zero to do with ag. It's 100% Atlanta's fault, if you want to put it that way. And the problems down here, uh, on the big creeks or ag, and then the integrated problem, if you will, is all of it together at Bainbridge is a combination of the two. And to use an old South Georgia analogy, the only way that we're going to help Florida, no matter what the court says, is if all the mules are pulling the wagon at the same time in the same direction, Atlanta and ag. It's going to take both. So, great question for clarity. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. So, so, uh, technically, I guess Atlanta has water recovery system sewage. Um, are, are they looking into water recovery systems from the atmosphere at this point? The, the people you're talking about from Georgia Tech? Um, Atlanta, Atlanta is doing an increase. And I'm, when I say Atlanta, I, I mean Metro Atlanta. Because to us, Atlanta is that giant red spot up there on the map, yellow, whatever. People in Noonan don't think that they live in Atlanta. I assure them they do live in Atlanta. Um, they'll, they'll argue with you. Um, they're, they're doing an increasingly good job of returning water to the river after they've used it. Now, you can't return all of it because there's evaporative loss, um, particularly with swimming pools and yards. Uh, that's like fields and ponds. You know, it's the same sort of deal. In terms of recovering water from the atmosphere, I'm not aware of any technologies that are going to put us there anytime soon. Right. Uh, no time. No. No time soon. What about the big black balls that they use up north? That they cover the lake top. Field? Now, to keep water from getting into the atmosphere, if that's what you're talking about. The largest consumptive use of water in the Apalachicola Chattahoochee Flint system, bigger than ag, is impoundments. And half of that evaporative loss comes from Georgia Power and federal impoundments, and the other half comes from private impoundments that are as small as a quarter acre. They're known as ponds. Believe it or not, all the ponds in the ACF are equal to the evaporation from the big reservoirs. They're approximately equal. So the technology that you just mentioned works. But then the question becomes, how many people are going to put big black balls all over their lake, right? I'm not going to answer that one today. Thank you. My name is Ryan Day. I'm the owner and operator of Sunset Organic Farms. I'm the lead agronomist for True Earth. And I had the privilege of working alongside Pretoria Field last year and this year, and it's been a great experience. I think we've done some pretty awesome things, you know, especially being uh, the first year for hemp last year went 
very well. It was very successful. Uh, we kind of had a late start, but in the end, I think we turned out a really good crop. But uh, like Tripp said, I'm going to talk to you guys about permaculture today and kind of just emphasize the key points of what permaculture is, why it's beneficial, and uh, why it's a good application to any farm, any situation with gardening. So what is permaculture? Permaculture is essentially a way of life. It's a blueprint for us that we can tackle certain situations and apply practical solutions. It originated from permanent agriculture, uh, the two terms, but later it evolved into the philosophy of permanent culture. So it can be applied to agriculture, but it can also be applied to other facets in culture, uh, whether it's society, uh, economics. It's not just for agriculture, but the main premise, especially in today's talk, is for agriculture. So the main concerns I believe for the future is that we got to be able to provide fresh water, nutritional food, and clean air. And a lot of times, you know, uh, in other countries, they encounter situations where they don't have access to these types of resources. Uh, I think we're very privileged here to be able to walk up to a faucet and just be able to drink directly from a faucet and not worry about getting sick. A lot of our food is regulated, and we have things like EPA that puts pollution in check. A lot of places don't have that, and a lot of it starts with at the ground, le ground level of gardens and uh, management practices that people implement throughout the globe. So permaculture stems from the idea of focusing on an ecosystem and noticing the natural resources that it gives, the abundance that's there. So essentially some guys walked out into a forest and started taking a look around and just noticing these things. And they was like, why aren't we applying this to agriculture? Why aren't we making our practices more environmentally friendly, but reaping the benefits, but at the same time meeting our needs, but also meeting the earth's needs. So essentially they wanted to replicate an ecosystem in an agricultural setting. The two guys that came up with uh, permaculture is Bill Mollison and David Holmgren. Bill Mollison is the father of agriculture or of permaculture. And they're both from Australia. They both were scientists and researchers. David Holmgren was the first one to put into words exactly what permaculture was. He did his thesis and created a manuscript specifically on permaculture. But these guys had some amazing ideas that they wanted to present to the world, but also they wanted it to make sense and be easy to understand to those who encountered these new types of methods. So what they wanted to do was focus on ethical approaches. They wanted to make sure that you're obtaining what you want, but you're also being ethical about the the way that you do things. So their first and foremost was earth care. Whatever you take from the earth, you need to make sure that you give back to the earth, you're environmentally friendly with your practices. But then they also wanted to be able to retrieve and obtain their own yields and their own needs. So they went into people care. People care is important because obviously anything we do, we want to be able to get something back from it. But it's important to keep the environment into, uh, into the ability to basically take care of the environment while you do these. So the third ethic, which is kind of, you know, it's, it's a, for different situations, but fair share. If you have a surplus of nutritional food, give to your neighbor. If you have surplus of vegetation, give back to the earth, use it for composting. But essentially you want to apply these three ethics, earth care, people care, and fair share to any practice that you do. So the way they wanted to instill these, uh, these ethics was by creating methods and techniques that revolved around 12 principles. So I'm going to go over the 12 principles with you guys real quick and kind of cover the basis of them, but obviously they can be a lot more complex in each situation. So the first is to observe and interact. By taking the time to engage with nature, we can design solutions that fit our particular situation. For example, when's the last time you took a walk or hike through your own property without having a time limit? Do you know what kind of birds live there? Do you know the diversity of life that you have there? What kind of plants, what kind of insects thrive there? Learn to benefit from the practices you put in place with your garden, especially those that mimic nature as close as possible. If you can mimic nature, you're creating the cycle of nutrients, you're giving back to the earth, you're meeting your own needs, but at the same time you should have ample abundance to give to your family, to your neighbors, and also back to the soil that you're pulling from. Obviously, in any situation, we use energy. 
But how can we catch that energy? How can we store the energy? By developing systems that collect resources when they are abundant, we can use them in times of need. An awesome example that I've seen that was kind of out of the box of uh, capturing energy where otherwise it wouldn't have been seen was in Costa Rica. So in Costa Rica, <clears throat> I went and I went to this little farm. It was, it was a really cool setup, but what they were doing, they were capturing cow manure and introducing it to water and then they would put it in a biodigester bag and was making methane. With that methane, <clears throat> they were able to warm their house because a lot of them were in the mountains. So when you think of Costa Rica, you don't think of cold weather, but there's a lot of spots where they needed to heat their homes, but they could also cook with it and they could even light their houses with it or create a lighting system so they could see in the dark. But the main premise is they found something where other people essentially would have never have looked to utilize it for energy. And obviously, anytime you do agriculture, you want to obtain a yield. So we want to ensure that your, that your truly useful rewards are benefited by the practices that you put in place. You want to make sure that if you put time and effort into something, you're getting something back from it. Your garden is potentially a prosperous yield, cutting down on grocery store trips, saving gas, and allowing you to enjoy your property, which I think is very important. A lot of times when we have gardens or farming practices, we get overwhelmed and it becomes work, but you know, if you do something you love, you never go to work, or at least it doesn't feel like you're working. If you're already doing the work, why not do it right? Apply organic, regenerative practices that not only get what you need from it, which is the yield, but also being beneficial to the land that you're taking from. There's nothing better than your backyard being your own grocery store. You know, you can go to the grocery store and you can pick out things, but you don't know what went into it, yeah, it may have a certification, but when it's in your backyard and you can take a step out and grab your own tomato, you know exactly what went into that tomato, how it was grown, and to me, food that you grow tastes better. So, so number four, the concept, apply self-regulation and accept feedback. Essentially, you want your practices after some time to run themselves as much as possible. That way you can cut down on the workload, but you can obtain the yield and make your practices better. And a lot of the ways of making your practices better is by being able to accept feedback. A lot of times when you work hard, it's, it's, it's difficult to hear someone giving you constructive criticism. But a lot of times it's true, pay attention. And it may not even be a person telling you this. It may be your plants. If your plants are drooping, something's wrong. If your plants are discoloring, something's wrong. Learn to speak the language of your plants so that you can hear the feedback from them as well. So in today's time, we have a lot of focus on renewable energy, which is an amazing thing, but it could also be with services, but it's very important to use and value renewables. Make the best use of nature's abundance to reduce our consumptive behavior and dependence on non-renewable resources. Modern society is finally getting on board for the focus of these renewable and shunning the notion of single use consumables. Whether it's your goats maintaining the height of your grass or capturing of sunlight with solar panels, renewable resources and services are key to efficiency. So waste is an anthropogenic concept. It is something that does not exist in nature. If you go into a forest, anything that is considered waste is not really waste. It's going back into the soil. It's the cycling of nutrients. This only applies to people. We created the concept of waste. In permaculture, they have a saying called moop, which is matter out of place. So just because we think it's out of place in nature, it fits somewhere. There's some way that it can be utilized, re, re, uh, become regenerative, and able to be accessed in different forms. Most organic waste can be recycled into compost. Find ways to repurpose materials that once have been served for another purpose. Remember, waste not, want not. So this is probably the main focus of permaculture though. Being able to design how your farm should run. What you want out of it, but do it efficiently. You need to be able to look at the whole design, see what kind of patterns that you want to implement, and then the details that come from those patterns. By taking a step back, we can observe patterns in nature and society. These can form the backbone of our designs with the details filled in as we go. It's okay if you don't know exactly how you want to start, but it's important to start and start the correct way and then adapt thereafter. 
So a way that permaculture has applied an easy way to approach your first design and then adapt that design as you go is called zoning. So it starts at zone zero and it goes all the way up to, you know, five, six, seven, whatever the case may be. And it's hard to see the picture here, but it does so, show essentially like zone zero is your house. And then zone five is way out in the woods somewhere or something that's more pristine. But the idea is the lower the zone, the more time and the more man manipulation that you do. So for example, if you have our herb garden at zone zero, that's something that you probably see every day. You go out, you cook with it. And then versus zone five may be a pristine forest. You don't visit it very often, but it gives you the ability to observe nature and natural occurrences that we can take back to zone zero, zone one, zone two, and apply. And make sure that we try to mimic nature as close as possible. So a lot of times when you ride, especially through South Georgia, you see monocultures or you see large uh, rows of crops that are the same crop over and over, but there's no integration. Everything is segregated. But in permaculture, segregation is not a good thing. It has the tendency to make us focus on one thing and then not allow us to adapt and then introduce other things that may benefit our practices, may benefit ourselves or increase our yields. By putting the right things in the right place, relationships develop between them and they support each other. For example, I don't know why they decided to grow the tomato away from the potato. You know, why can't we grow these things together? Why can't we walk to one garden and be able to pick multiple things instead of having to have them, you know, 10 acres of this crop, five acres of that crop, we can integrate these and not have them segregated. And a lot of times each plant benefits itself. Lot, when people see weeds, they see competition, but there is a such thing as good competition. So, as Mr. Gordon was talking about earlier, the, the idea is that you gotta go big or go home, or you're not gonna be able to succeed in farming. If you're not turning over vast amounts of yields and able to sell those yields and outcompete other people, then more than likely you're not gonna make it. But in permaculture, the focus is to use small, slow solutions. Small and slow systems are easier to maintain than big ones, making better use of local resources and produce, producing more sustainable outcomes. When you start something new, it's easier to start out smaller, and then if it does well, go big the next year or make it bigger as you go along. But start out small, perfect your practices, and then expand on that. And even if you didn't succeed starting out small, just go a little smaller next year until you can get the grasp of it. But either way, you start small and use slow solutions. You don't want to go big because you'll probably end up going home. So use and value diversity. This is a ecological concept and permaculture is based strongly off of ecosystems and benefiting the ecology that your practices are located in. Diversity reduces vulnerability to a variety of threats and takes advantages of the unique nature of the environment in which it resides. Like I said, permaculture is based on ecology. Understand the benefits of the ecosystem and then encourage diversity and then you should have thriving bounty of resources. You don't want to focus on just one outcome. Make sure that you have the ability to receive multiple uh, sources of revenue. Make sure you have different types of plant that you can gain nutrition from. Don't focus on one thing. And also encourage different birds. Put up bird houses, put up feeders, put up pollinator plants that encourages your bees to come out and turn your tomato flowers actually into tomatoes. So a lot of times we have value, we have marginal lands and edges that aren't valued. So it may be as simple as something on a tree line that all they ever do is mow with it mow it or they might go out and spray it. But a lot of times these places are very bountiful and have a lot of nutritional value in the soil. The interface between the components in an ecosystem is where the most interesting events take place. These are often the most valuable, diverse, and productive elements in the system. We have a tendency to neglect these and we definitely need to do the opposite. When we overlook marginal spaces, we potentially lose our most productive system. So why are you going to run the risk of not utilizing a productive system when it may be your most productive? 
And number 12 encompasses all of these concepts into one. You got to be able to creatively approach your practices and respond to any change. There's no cure-all practice for any application. You can always make it better. You should always strive to make it better. We can have a positive impact on the inevitable change, be carefully observed, and then intervene at the right time. If things have worked well in the past, continue to improve, but make them better. Do not become complacent. Make sure that you are constantly bettering your, uh, your goals, your, the, end, the end goals that you want to achieve. Always pursue a better practice. So in summary, permaculture is modeled after natural ecosystems and based on ethical principles. When we observe nature, we can mimic the process to greatly benefit us and the environment. With proper design, one can provide their own food, energy, shelter, and other materials in a sustainable way. Permaculture is all about sustainability, being regenerative, but also obtaining the yield that we're going after. If we don't get what we need out of it, something's flawed with the plan. If we don't take care of the earth, something's flawed with the plan. And if you can give to your neighbor, then obviously your plan is doing really well. So you want to include these three ethics and these principles. And it's, it may seem complex, but it's really not. It can go, you can start very small and work your way to a better solution. All in all, knowing the language of your garden can not only allow you to communicate with nature on a deeper, more understanding level, but will also provide a way to recognize signs of alarm aka deficiencies, stress, sickness, but be able to adapt. Thank you. So if anybody would like to ask any questions, I'll be more than happy. So can you describe briefly the difference between the energy utilization and production in say a monoculture corn crop as opposed to say an acre of well-developed permaculture? Yeah, so the first thing is anytime you start with monoculture, you run the risk of that entire crop being wiped out. There's going to be essentially no revenue if you have a disease that attacks that crop. When you have diversity, even if that corn crop does you know, suffer, you may have tomatoes in place. You may have things like basil or whatever other nutritional value or textile or industrial resource that you're trying to create in your practices. Um, you also have a tendency to have to apply a lot more uh, irrigation to the monoculture versus when you have integrated crops next to each other, they hold a lot more water. They increase like biology in the soil. Diversity is key to attacking vulnerable diseases and keeping them at bay and preventing. Uh, utilization of the sun. So, I mean, if you think about it, a, a small corn plant per acre of energy util or sun of sunlight energy utilized is so much less than when you think about um, think about an oak tree or you know or a layered can canopy yeah. and how that harvests sunlight much more efficiently because really what you're doing as a farmer and I, I think one of the things that I really love about permaculture is that um, it's all about how can you harvest the most sunlight per unit acre and yep. so and then turn that energy into usable substrate for you know for farming yeah so there there's a, a perfect example called the three sister method where they have what's considered a, a horizontal plane so at each level you have like a tall crop a medium crop and then a lower ground level but you have a lower ground level, for example, that's utilizing sunlight in a shady environment. And then you have the medium, which would be essentially like beans. And then you have like a corn crop growing, right? So normally when you have the corn growing, that's the only horizontal plane that's achieving sun or accepting, accepting sunlight. But then you have all this other sunlight that's actually passing through that can be utilized or put into lower lying crops. So you gain more diversity, but at the same time, you're utilizing something like you're saying with the sunlight. It's, it's all being captured as much as possible. You're not letting it pass through or being a waste of potential. And that's kind of like observing your property, seeing what resources are there. So essentially, the more diversity you have, the more capture you can have of something like sunlight, or, or, or it's a more efficient water usage. Right, or capture of water would yeah, be water, another good, yeah. which, which Gordon was talking about, like 
with this farming principle, I mean, really you don't even need center pivot. In fact, center pivot agriculture, I'm, I'm not sure how it fits in, really. Well, say you like can do some things that would be more like this, but, but for the most part, it, you, you shouldn't need that kind of irrigation with... Well, that's like when you see corn, a lot of times you see the water, while it's literally being irrigated, it's just rus rushing down the hill beneath the corn. Why not plant something that's low-lying that can stop erosion a little bit, at least somewhat, and then also utilize that extra water that you're throwing out there. That is also creating issues in like the Flint River, you know, rush off of nutrients. It's like the difference between a sieve and a sponge. Yeah. So I mean, monoculture acts like a sieve and your water's going straight through. And then, you know, a good permaculture area should act like a sponge where those yeah, roots totally and areas, yeah. areas are actually soaking it up and then slowly releasing the water back You're out. As, as many layers as possible, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, thanks for letting me uh, give you guys a talk, and it's been a pleasure working alongside Victoria with two of A little history, quick one. I mean, it could be a long one, but we're going to make it a short one. We started um, doing a lot of research and development work on some fertilizer based on the system that I developed probably about six years ago. It was based on aquaponic raising fish and in uh, in water and utilizing that water to fertilize the plant uh, it progressed on to a fertilizer that we developed as a microorganism uh, base and it's fish emulsion and started doing a lot of research we did four years of replicable trials with cotton soybean peanuts it was just kind of a uh, let's see what we're doing here and, and trying to figure out um, the results and come to find out that we did really well in replicating in cell walls of plants, which is what I want to focus on in a minute, about water retention of the plants. So if you're able to keep the retention of the water in the plant, you don't need to turn on the pivot as often. And so that's developing the cell walls, and the cell walls are developed based on the ability of that plant to put on the healthy cord of armor, being able to take and uh, utilize the fertilizer. Uh, a lot of people talk about 10-10-10 is a conventional fertilizer. Only about 2 to 3 percent of that fertilizer actually is plant available. So the rest of the stuff, the plant don't even recognize it. You're buying 10-10-10, but the plants only can use 2 3 percent of it. Uh, and what we try to do is to build a fertilizer that's 100 percent available to the plant. We utilize a lot less fertilizer to go to the same crop. I've repl uh, replicated that probably about, I don't know, eight growing season all to go together on multiple types of crop and uh, we've been able to kind of attain about a 40 percent yield increase everything being equal to conventional farming um, started uh, got really interested in health um, medical reason and and that switched over to you know what is my fertilizer actually doing to the plant and we found out that it actually increases a lot of uh, of its nutrients and, and potency and uh, we started working with the uh, trip here at this farm with Ryan leading the way, uh, and making sure everything is following our protocol. I'm supposed to be moving this forward as I talk, but I'm forgetting the <laughs> image. Uh, all right, so this is my team, uh, and a lot of people are missing. But this is one of the things that we did with the fertilizer and the microorganism. We actually come up with a bio tea and actually employed this on. Uh, this farm last year, um, with Tyler being able to manage that project here at this farm, and that was just a singular test. That was just a demo type kind of thing, and we practiced it and did it and felt that we were impacting the hard pan in the garden to where we can actually get full saturation instead of trying to get migration and water and the plant trying to move sideways instead of going into the earth. So we got more plant, more biomass, more water retention. Less water is required to keep that plant alive. So it was just trying to use some common sense and apply some of those results to moving forward. Um, my whole team is here. I won't, not that I don't want to recognize everybody, but I really want to focus more a little bit about the science because um, my time's going to be running low here. Okay, thank you. So Jennifer is our COO, Denise is our CFO, Leslie is our RN, and uh, clinical. Research person, Charlene, uh, he's not here. 
but then you got Rachel and Ryan, our lead agronomist. Eli uh, is a soil web scientist, which is a phenomenal kind of guy. He's kind of like, I don't know, he's, he's out there in that web with the, <laughs> the whole philosophy. And we have three doctors that are supportive of us, and Trip Morgan happened to be one of them. Um, then we got Chelsea, which is a master herbalist. We also grow our own medicine. So the, our company is from soil to oil. And that's very important to understand that if you've got any contaminants in the ground, then plant's going to suck it up along with the stuff. So the quality of the actual product that you deliver has got to be started at soil. And we've learned a lot about that. Hemp loves to suck lead, arsenics, different types of metals out of soil. It just sucks it up. So basically, um, Having all those guys there to tell us and guide us and direct us. We have uh, two PhDs that's working on our blueberry uh, project. We work with a blueberry farmer uh, in Alma, Georgia, and uh, it's been a phenomenal thing. So their, their whole life has been spent blueberry and muscadine. So we were able to tap into them by the grace of God, and uh, they got excited, and they retired now. They're working on this project for us to understand blueberry and what's its potential antioxidants and so on. But it all goes back down to this, the food of the plant. Uh, we do all, most of our stuff is foliar fed, but subsoiling is a very important step. You really don't need to do that but one time. Uh, I'm, I say that because I've done three years of it now and it's not been required. And the soil biology grows from that subsoiling Trip actually did majority of this farm uh, subsoil and we built the machine um, that we're injecting our solution 18 to 22 inches below the soil level and uh, I think we've seen some major difference from the last three years of your blueberries I think could be contributed to the subsoil and it's beneficial so Trip is very very in tune with to try and whatever makes sense uh, and, and knows and recognize that we have to find better ways of doing things. I mean, we're being hand hauled by fertilizer company, seed company. You can't grow this seed unless you put this product on it. And uh, it, it's to uh, control. So we're, we're researching ways of doing things a little differently. But um, then we actually grow all of our medicine um, from soil to oil, like I told you. And uh, we maintain a good record of tra transparency on everything that we do. The biggest thing is that um, Trip is able and willing to follow a protocol that I believe in, and, and I admire him for doing that. And you know, I went to three meetings before I actually met Trip to uh, uh, promote tutorial. And uh, on the fourth meeting, I introduced myself. And last year, we did our first project and now we're doing this year and it's so far been a great experience we're all uh, involved with a lot of people everybody has a food concern uh, I don't know if you know this or not but any given day uh, two weeks from now we can all be starving and it sounds crazy but it's true uh, with all the infrastructure that we have to deal with the farmer uh, blots. So it, it's just crazy that we're really two weeks away and everybody thinks Walmart is going to have the food ready for us when we get there or Publix and it's not. So we need to learn to be more uh, self-sufficient, more regenerative. Uh, Ryan uh, is pushing that permaculture on our side and because we now know that plants communicate with one another through mycelium which is a fungal. Um, it, it's just a huge unexplored um, uh, <laughs> uh, area of, um, of of science. I mean, it's just unbelievable that we've been growing food all these years, but we don't understand the soil. I mean, you're talking about microwizels, you're talking about nematode eating fungus, and fungus feeding sugar and sugar feeding microwizels a tunnel for the plant to get its food source. It's just crazy. So that's what I'm involved in, in and really want to understand is completely maximize the plant's potential. If the plant has everything that it's required, it's going to do whatever it's going to do to its maximum. But if it's missing one little element, one little bio bugs in the ground that's exchanging these things, it's not going to do its best. So I think performance, yield, is all dependent about the earth. If you get the earth tuned in, 
and then you'll be able to grow good, healthy, nutritional food for our system, our bodies. That's my daughter, uh, Kristen. Uh, she's a big proponent. She's anti-chemical and all that stuff. And uh, my wife and I went through some huge thing. Uh, and some of you know pancreatic cancer. And uh, uh, we learned a lot about the chemicals. And, and we wanted to change our lives. And, and what we eat triggers things that shouldn't be triggered. Uh, it was a, a huge... Uh, incentive for me to, to do what I'm doing now and plus working with Ryan and Jennifer and everybody else it's just uh, it's not a job it's just uh, a coalition of uh, we have a common purpose and a common thought uh, Leslie being with the health side of it it helps me and helps us understand yeah this chemical does this and it's just a huge resource that she offers to our team so we're not just about one thing water conservation I'm 100% uh, understanding that we are impacted and that if I can have that plant, that soybean, retain 30% more water, this means I don't have to irrigate it for two, three, four days more. So retention, plant cells, the walls, how much water is a hole? Um, and we grow a black turmeric, which is a rare rhizome um, in Savannah, in Hawaii. Um, that's it. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I got off the, the, the PowerPoint. Actually, the PowerPoint was given to me this morning by my COO. And after listening to uh, Ryan and uh, the River Keeper people, I think that I needed to focus more about the soil and the oil and, and the water conservation. Uh, I didn't want to get into the medicine part that we do. Uh, it's an awesome product, um, but I really wanted to emphasize that we're taking a step to um, making sure that we can be sustainable and regenerative, being able to reuse things and be able to take and, and sustain ourselves. Grocery stores, we can't count on that. And I really believe that all of our food supplies should be coming within the regional, local bases. Some in your backyard, some in the community garden. One of our projects we're doing in, um, in Savannah is that we're growing our turmeric and we have a research farm there. But in the middle of a cul-de-sac in the neighborhood, we got this whole cul-de-sac plot up and basically we're going to grow food for that community and employ our findings from our fertilizer trials. Because I mean, the fertilizer we make ourselves. I mean, we're not buying the stuff and, and recalculate it. We, we actually grow it for a very, very um, specific purpose. So that's, that's what I'm talking about is that we have to become more self-sufficient, more reliable on ourselves. So you mentioned that drip did uh, subsoiling. What exactly is the subsoiling? Like what it, what did y'all do to improve the soil? Well, we utilize them. I mean, subsoil in practice, basically, um, we use our fertilizer and we dilute it down and we took and make bio tea from compost. The fertilizer is there to basically feed the microorganism. And we take that and I don't know if I, um, is, was it transferred over? Yeah, yeah. So this is interesting because this is exactly the reason I decided to go with the permaculture. Is what, so I'm talking to Eli, and tell him a little bit about Eli. I don't even know, I don't know how to tell. Eli's a, um, kind of a hippie guy. Well, I'll, 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 paint, I'll paint Eli for you. So uh, this is how this whole thing is developed. I mean, this is going to sound crazy, and I appreciate y'all helping me burn some time. Uh, my mind is completely consumed on you know what we've been able to achieve this past weekend. Uh, Eli's uh, mother is a stylist, cuts hair. My mother-in-law lives in Jacksonville. She gets her hair cut uh, by his mom, and basically, our guy in Colorado's mom gets her hair cut from Eli's mom. So Eli finds out what we're doing through his mom and asks me to contact him. So he invited me to go to his house. So I go into Jacksonville, and this is no joke. I've seen this in my own two eyes. You go into this neighborhood, and basically beautiful manicured yard, and uh, you know, real nice neighborhood. And then all of a sudden, you hit a wall, and this jungle 
appears out of nowhere. This is Eli's house. And I get out, and I'm going, man, this, I couldn't see the house from the road. So, but they got bamboo trees, and got all kinds of fruit trees, and low-lying crops, and uh, moringa trees. And I'm getting out, I'm saying, and the layout, um, Eli comes walking out of his house and this little path, I'm not joking. And he says, come on, I'll show you what I got going on. Now, and he says, oh, be careful, don't step on this and don't step on that. But his whole yard is nothing but food for him. So depending on what day it is, uh, he just goes out there and, and uh, picks his own food. But, and then the next lot over, it's another beautiful yard. But this really just like square jungle uh, lot. So, so the interesting, so there's a couple of things, and I, I love Eli, I wish he could have been here, because um, I think he adds so much to, to what we're doing, but, so I'm talking to him, and I'm talking about our blueberries, and how they've been struggling, and I'm complaining about, our, I'm basically complaining about how hard organic farming is, okay, so it's all weeds, bugs, you know, death of your trees. And he said, well, did you plant everything in rows? And I said, yes. And he said, well, you're probably using sulfuric acid to uh, to acidify your water because you have alkaline water. I said, yes. He named a couple other things. He goes, well, you know, your acidification is killing your, um, killing the mycelia, your, uh, the fact, you know, your trees should actually be thro grown near a forest because it's uh, it's actually a low-lying edge of your blueberries. Talk about the low-lying edge of the, crop and then and then it sort of struck me like if you look at that first field and it's not here it's on the other side the plants that were all next to the forest were doing really well as you get farther and farther out the plant started to get worse and worse and worse and so it just struck me that everything that he was saying made sense so really you know that that I hope that combines with what you were saying that, no, that was exactly. I mean it was just you know it was like this part and then well, but if you didn't, if you were actually have the, um, had the compost and stuff from the forest, that would acidify the soil itself and you wouldn't need the sulfuric acid, which is actually killing your mycelia. And there's, I think you mentioned it, there's a, there's a comment in, that's commonly used in permaculture, which is the cure is, your cure is the problem. So, you know, the organic, organophosphate fertilizer, the, the fungicide, the herbicide that you're putting on your crop to kill whatever else, that actually is the problem. Um, it's been a huge issue with beef, beef farming. So, yeah, I mean, a lot I, of, I say all that to say I agree with you. Oh, no, I, like, I'm good. Like, <laughs> yeah. the, big, the, the biggest thing, too, is that just because it says organic doesn't mean it's a good thing, right? So, we got to be careful about what organic means. I mean, there's a lot of thing with that. And if it will kill a bug on your plant, it'll kill the bug in the ground that's trying to feed the plant, too. So it passes through. Thanks, y'all. I appreciate it. Thanks, Trip. Thanks, I found out that I'm very horrible at speech titles. I was going to call it Weed Between the Lines, and then I decided, well, I decided, well, that's not great. And then I was like, well, how about Pot and Pots? And I was like, well, that's not good. So I wanted to, like, really focus my title. And I'm sorry, we're really not going to be able to see this very well. But that's okay. Everything that I'm saying today will be downloadable. Um, you can email Liv Lawnick and she'll give you the entire PowerPoint. Because um, I know that a lot of what this, a lot of the text in this speech is very critical and, and good for, for people who want to start growing hemp. Um, so I decided I'd title the, the speech today with basically the two biggest points that I felt like I could make that all the industry people that I've met over the last year have told me time and time again. Um, I probably met, give or take, 10 people, 100, uh, I guess you'd call them experts in the, in the business. Um, so I titled it today, Hemp Horticulture, Taxonomy and Natural Origins. And I'm gonna use my phone the entire time today. I'm, apologies if y'all are used to, uh, you know, uh, eye to eye, but I'm gonna use this today. Um, and so I've titled it Hemp Horticulture Tax Taxonomy and Natural Origins, a Long-Standing Case for Legality. Uh, in that title uh, resides the two most important things that will develop out of, out of what's going to be a, a thriving hemp industry in the next 10 years. Uh, the, the first part of it, Hemp Horticulture, um, and I'll go ahead and switch, and I'm going to, 
I'm going to try and time myself too. So it's 3.07. Um, so hemp horticulture has evolved in, a, in basically a usually uh, highly organic process since the 1980s. Um, right around the mid 80s was, was when basically everybody started to realize, hey, if we're going to get people to you know, use this stuff. Back in those days, it was just smoking. There was no brownies, no edibles. Um, then we need to make it kind to their bodies. We need to make it really good on their bodies. No, no poisons, no toxins. Um, and so it was refined basically by the middle, middle 80s. Uh, basically right around 1985 or so is when you really started to see that transition in the industry. Um, the decriminalization of all cannabis species is basically at this point months away. It's not years away. It's literally at this point probably the first thing that Congress is going to focus on once COVID's a thing of the past is they're going to focus on decriminalization of marijuana. That's all forms of it, all species of it. Um, and so this is this is why I said a long-standing case for legality is because the market is already organic. It's already very safe. It's a very it, it ideally led the entire organic market. It, it's it's kind of how organics evolved in America. Um, and so this is the one thing is that by by regulating all the commodities all the commodities that are associated with cannabis through legislation, through agronomy, through a growth protocol, that that we can basically remove all of the black market shortcuts and toxicities so i know that you know y'all understand that not everybody that's out there in the industry on the black market is in it for for our health uh it actually runs into a lot of problems in california a lot of the marijuana that comes out of california has a lot of really bad herbicides on it that work well on marijuana but they don't work well on the human body. They actually can cause some serious renal problems. They can cause some serious GI problems. Um, so it's out there. But if it's regulated, you know, regulation basically defines health in a lot of ways in America for a lot of different crops. And, and, and you know, Rand Paul, I know y'all know who Rand Paul is. He's, he's in favor of all, basically all drugs being regulated. I'm talking about cannabis today, and I can tell you that nothing is more important to the cannabis industry than the regulation of all products that come out of it. And so if it does legalize in the next few months in the Senate, passes in the Senate, we're going to be in a real good spot to, to basically not have to worry about any kind of, of, of secondary issues that are associated with its use. Um, so we're going to back off of that. The cannabis family uh, is called Cannabaceae. Uh, there's three known species right now, uh, cannabis sativa, which basically comes out of Latin America, cannabis indica, which basically comes out of India and um, Western Russia, and then cannabis ruderalis, which basically comes out of Siberia. Um, those have been the three standard species for the last 40 years that are recognized generally by everybody. The family itself branched off from the elm family, or Olmaceae, which is uh, a notorious family for, I wouldn't say necessarily psychoactive plants, but plants that have chemicals in them that mess with us, quote unquote. Uh, one of the most famous ones is stinging nettle. I don't know if y'all have ever ran across stinging nettle going to a park or going to a, you know, a nature hike or whatever, but when you touch it, um, basically within 15 seconds your skin is going to be burning. Um, I, I don't know what the chemical is in it that, that's associated with stinging nettle. don't know how close it is to CBD, but the family itself has a lot of what you would otherwise consider somatotropic or psychotropic chemicals in them. Um, so the closest relative in, in Olmus or in the elm family to cannabis is actually the hackberry. Uh, we have one at our other field, which I'm going to be at this afternoon if y'all want to go out and check things out. Um, hackberry is a notorious weed tree in Georgia in the southeast. Um, it's basically still in a lot of people's minds of, 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 of botanists who are way more experienced than I am, considered to be a part of the cannabis family. It, it's almost the closest competitor that you can get to to, to 
cannabis without it being cannabis. And so I'm going to just show you, and I'll skip that page about what I just talked about, but that's okay. So there's also a new species being introduced called Cannabis Australis. Australis. Um, I'm not going to use the word, but it's called Australian Blank Cannabis. Y'all can look it up on your own. It's a dirty word. Um, and so the outer picture that you see here is an elm seedling. And the inner picture that you see here is a cannabis seedling. It's very hard to tell, but they are basically indeterminable. If you sprouted a thousand elm seeds and a thousand cannabis seeds and you intermingled them, you couldn't tell which one was which for the first 28 days probably, 21 days at least. Um, okay, and so now we're going to go back to the other three main species. And this is them shown in leaf profile. And so uh, indica here, with it being from, Indi uh, from India and Western Russia, uh, they have a little bit of a wetter climate down there. So generally you typically find with all plants that the drier an environment is and the hotter an environment is, the more narrow the leaves tend to be. And then as you get hotter and hotter, a lot of times it tends to be the smaller the leaves so indica coming from India all the way over into Western and Southern Russia and Europe has got really fat leaves because there's a little bit more moisture there. Sativa coming from, and this is all theorized, but it tend to, tend, people tend to say it comes from Latin America. Uh, very dry down there, it can be wet, but in Mexico especially it's very dry. So you notice the long thin leaves. Um, the hybrid part here, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you have all different variations between these two plants, the indica and the sativa. Um, Ruderalis is not really used a lot in the market except for, for auto flowers because Ruderalis is the only natural species that flowers without regards to daylight. So it basically starts flowering as soon as it's mature. Um, so Ruderalis, the one thing I was telling Kathy this morning is uh, if you've got a plant and throughout the entirety of its life it never has more than five leaves then you can be guaranteed that it comes from a ruderalis uh, background. Um, so this is the four species I was telling you about that's just now kind of come out. Cannabis australis. I uh, titled it in this photo Not Your Grandma's Azalea because if you can see this picture better which you kind of can see it now it literally looks like an azalea, like the azaleas you would buy at Lowe's or Walmart or Home Depot or wherever. Um, it has no bearings, it has basically no similarities to any of the other plants other than other than than the fact that where the leaves come out of the stems, the morphology is similar. And so that's kind of how they discover that it was a part of the cannabis family. Other than that, I really don't know a lot about it. It's, it's brand new. It's something that I didn't even know about until four months ago, but it exists, and they claim that it's a new species, and they're charging $17.50 for one seed, so we are not going to be buying any of those. <laughs> um, I tried to buy some clones two weeks ago, and I, they had all these new flavors that I really want to try. They were $12.50 each instead of $3 each. What's so, the selling point? I mean, the selling point is that they have somehow or another, I mean, I hate to use these words, but they have modified it. So you obviously understand <laughs> GMO. Not that it's a bad thing. It's not in all cases. All of the strains of marijuana that are the most popular in the market now have been adapted in the last 12 months to CBD. So I don't know anything about the marijuana market, but <laughs> three of the biggest strains are uh, Gorilla Glue, uh, Girl Scout Cookies, and um, I guess you would call it the White Series. So a lot of those are all offshoots of, of those three series in terms of medical marijuana that has over 20% THC. Uh, those have all been basically adapted to create just CBD now. And for them to have done that in the last 12 months means that there's some guy out there that's a real scientist that's really doing that, that genetic work, that leg work, to, to have gotten them here this quick. I didn't think it would be available in, in those forms for three or four more years. 
Um, so I just want to talk real quick about the origins of CBD hemp. Uh, there's two main uh, theories um, that kind of come out of the CBD industry when you talk about the origins of it. Uh, one group of people says that basically, so the Basque people are a uh, indigenous population, more or less. They were migrants, but they were, you know, uh, just migratory peoples that ended up landing in Spain. I can't remember whether it's North or South Spain. Um, they are completely different from, from the Spanish population. Uh, they like to drink. They like to drink red wine. They like to drink beer. They like to drink white wine. Sometimes they drink it all on the same night. Um, they claim, as, a, as an ethnicity, that they found CBD hemp. Now, whether or not that's true or not, I don't know, but the story goes uh, the people wanted to relieve their hangovers the next day. They knew that marijuana would do it, but it also made them high, and when they were hungover, it would especially make them paranoid. So they kept smoking different plants in different people's fields until they found one that didn't get them high, but that also relieved the pain. So that's the first theory of where CBD came from. The second theory is actually a guy that tried to put a patent on the CBD molecule. Um, that did not occur. It, it has been fought many times in court cases. Uh, he created it for a, a, actually a juvenile patient's uh, unbearable conditions with, I believe, cancer. Um, I may be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure it was cancer. And I, I don't want to mention any names because he would probably put a lawsuit up against me, but that's the other main theory. Uh, my bold opinion on it is that it's always been there, which um, technically, as far back as we know it has, there's a guy named Ed Rosenthal that's out of, Cal I think he's out of California. Um, he has been talking about CBD since the early 80s. Um, and, and he has known since the early 80s that the one precursor to THC, which is CBGA, um, if it were cut at that point in the plant, it would turn to CBG, which is a big, huge market now. Everybody, a lot of people love CBG, but a lot of people get headaches from it. Um, so there's two pathways that, that CBG can, can be acted upon in the, in the metabolic process or an anabolic process. Uh, one of them is to be attacked by an enzyme called THCA synthase. THCA synthase is basically uh, a protein or an enzyme that turns CBGA into THCA. Okay. The other uh, enzyme or protein that can be acted on is CBDA synthase. Um, if CBGA is acted on by CBDA synthase, it turns into CBDA, which eventually becomes CBD. So, for one human being or for a hundred human beings to create a complex protein that created CBD out of the blue in the last 20 years is absolutely impossible. And, and I'm, I would not say that unless I felt really comfortable about saying it. And so there's no way that somebody created CBD. Uh, there, there is a way uh, that you could have a patent on it for two, three years maybe, but this man that, that claims to have a patent on it uh, really doesn't have the rights, especially since Ed Rosenthal has spoken about it since the early 80s, to try and patent something that's that's on the free market still, that, that's not, that's not tagged genetically by companies like Monsanto. So my bold opinion is that it, it basically high CBD, low THC plants have always been there. And that at best they were just discovered. They were not the CBDA synthase protein or enzyme was not created by a human. I mean, it, it would take 100 humans 10, maybe 12 years just to create such a complex protein. And, I, and I've looked at the protein that's big enough that it's, it's just, it's, it's simply impossible. Uh, I want to talk real quick about a couple of misconceptions about him. Some of these we don't know, the, the, the verdict's still out. Um, I've already mentioned this before. A lot of people in the industry claim it's not genetically modified. Uh, it basically is. Um, anytime you try and attempt to make feminized seeds, you turn a female plant into a male plant with silver and you 
basically self-fertilize the same female plant or clones of the same plant, uh, you're, you're significantly genetically modifying that organism at that point. Uh, seeds uh, are a trade-off. When we started last year, we were told by the industry that if a CBD plant goes to seed, that it's going to lose its ability to create CBD by about 52-55% in volume. Um, in the lab, that's not necessarily true. So, you know, you can have seeds in, in, in biomass and, and basically still get up to where you need to be around the 8, 10, 12, up to 15% CBD content. Uh, the biggest myth that we came across was that hemp is a weed suppressor. Um, I know from the last eight weeks in the greenhouse that it can suppress itself especially if you put two or three seeds in one cell, they can suppress each other. Um, but in the field, and Tyler is going to talk to y'all a little bit more about farming, and Harris will both tell y'all that it is not a weed suppressor in the field. It has literally zero effect on any weeds, and these weeds can be one inch or one yard away from the plant. It doesn't affect weeds in, in one bit. Um, and so I want to I want to justify that with a couple of quick slides. And again, y'all can email Liv, and she'll give you this whole speech to get these pictures. Uh, these are these these next few slides are true weed suppressors. Okay. So this is the first one. This is Crotalaria. Uh, I don't know how how much y'all know about beans and and uh, Fabaceae, but Crotalaria is a great nitrogen fixer. It actually puts a lot of nitrogen in the soil. Some people grow it and cut it before it goes to seed just to add nitrogen to their fields. It is a it is considered the best nitrogen uh, additive for a spring crop prior to planting. You know, anything from, even though soybeans make their own nitrogen, it's still great for anything from soybeans to corn to cotton to peanuts, all the, the southern trifecta crops. Um, so Crotalaria would be considered an excellent weed suppressor. Once it's grown in the field, you have to cut it at a specific time because if you don't, then it's going to exude those chemicals from the roots until they're available in the soil or they're in the soil uh, to, to such a high extent that you're going to have problems with your crops after that. They're not going to grow as quick as they would, and sometimes they won't grow at all. Uh, uh -oh. I, think I, I think I skipped that. Let's see if I did. Yeah, so this is the second one. Uh, this is actually what I've grown for two cycles, two seasons now. Pigeon peas. Um, they're yellow lentils. I don't know if y'all shop at Publix a lot. Um, there's actually a brand of hummus called Lantana, like the flower. Uh, Lantana yellow lentil hummus. Um, this is what yeah, uh, Lantana yellow lentil hummus is made out of. It's pigeon peas. Um, and so pigeon peas are also a very excellent example of an allelopathic or weed suppressing species. Um, they, they put so much chemicals out that uh, they basically, you can grow them for five years without any kind of significant weed, uh, weed overtake. And it's considered a, a good thing for the industry, especially for uh, sustainable ag, for regenerative ag, because you can get four years of crop out of it. So you plant one seed and you don't have to plant seeds again for four more years. It's a true allelopath. It's a huge weed suppressor. And, and the reason why you can get a crop for four years has a lot to do with that, with the fact that it's keeping weeds at bay. A walnut is the biggest, generally speaking, the, the flag boy for, for, for allelopaths. Um, we had a guy grow in Brazelton, Georgia this year. He had 400 plants that were within 40 yards of the walnut tree that was mature. He lost all 400 of those plants because of the walnut tree. And it was obvious because he actually had 1,000 plants and the 400 literally almost came out within a perfect half circle of, of the walnut tree. So you knew that that was where the root zone was and they literally, that, that one tree literally killed 400 of those plants. So that's a real weed suppressor. It's a real allelopath. Hemp is not an allelopath in the same way that these, these plants I showed you were. So we're going to switch up now. 
the main rule last year was to not make your plants go hot or test more than 0.3% THC. Um, I'm not going to say this is the truth, but they feel like this year that it's going to be moved up to 1.3%. If that happens, basically none of our farmers will ever have to worry again about plants going hot because all the plants that we get, there's no way that they would even produce 1.5% CBD. It's, it's virtually, I say virtually because I don't want to say literally, impossible. But I'm going to go ahead and tell y'all that these are the factors that I've determined really affect the THC production. So if you stay away from these things, you're going to be in a, in a much better position not to have plants that test hot for THC. The first two things, I know y'all, I know Claude talked earlier about 10, 10, 10. Uh, the first number is nitrogen, the second number is phosphorus, the third number is potassium. So the N and the P, the first two numbers, too much nitrogen and too much phosphorus can really make your plants go hot. Phosphorus is what your roots need a lot, and when you produce too, too, too much of an abundance of roots, that leads to that pathway of basically turning it into marijuana. Uh, nitrogen is basically kind of almost a, a side path. What it does is it makes the plant grow too quick, the plant cells become long and thin, and when they do that, Cole mentioned this earlier, talking about long, thin cell walls, you want big, you want small, thick cell walls. When they get thin and they start getting attacked, then you're going into a, a situation because of nitrogen, where your plant's going to produce THC just to fight off disease and fight off insects. Um, the second thing is excessive heat or UVA or UVB exposure. They've actually determined that UVB is one of the key components to creating THC. So when you get UVB, especially in the fall, that's when the plants really start to turn it on and get hot. Um, the third thing is pathogens in the water system. That doesn't really matter except for in, um, in hydroponics and in city water. In hydroponics, it's because it's a closed system. It's not like nature and rain. In city water, you've got to deal with um, basically uh, bicarbonates and salt, so sodium and bicarbonates uh, are in, in city water in, in excessive amounts compared to well water or compared to rainwater. So when you get I call those a pathogen, they're not, they're just chemicals, but when, they, when they're in the water in, in abundance, that's going to produce your THC or, or begin the pathway to producing it. Uh, a lack of surplus, a lack or surplus of fertilizer or water also causes it to go hot. So if you're putting too much fertilizer or not enough, you're going to get hot plants. If you're not putting enough water or putting too much water, same thing. Chitin is a protein that's found in basically... 100% of all insects. Um, it's also found in crabs and a lot of uh, like crawfish today have chitin in them. Um, once a plant detects chitin, it starts producing THC immediately to get rid of the bug. So, <clears throat> so basically, the one thing you need to think, think, of, think about or get out of this is to never use crab meal in your growth. So if, if any of y'all are used to or even heard of using crab meal as a great fertilizer, don't use it in, in cannabis. Uh, the third thing is, uh, is actually an offshoot of chitin. So when chitin is detected by the plant, it goes into what's called a systemic induced response or SIR. So when the systemic induced response occurs, the plant immediately starts putting out B vitamins. And if it's got a lot of calcium in the plant, then it's automatically going to start, it's going to have all the pathways it needs to immediately start putting tons and tons of THC into the plant. So that's where you get these situations where somebody, instead of having 0.3% THC on the CBD plant, will have 1%. Um, there's actually this one guy, other than Ed Rosenthal, that I really think is basically the foremost authority in not just cannabis. His name's Harley Smith. Um, He's, he's been on YouTube for probably 10 years, but he is considered the guru of all things botany in America right now. Uh, he's, he's, he's one of his own, he's basically in his own school by himself. Most other botanists don't agree with a lot of what he has to say, but he is, he is the man when it comes to all things botany. 
I would encourage y'all to look him up on YouTube and watch some of, the, of his videos. I didn't understand him for the first two months that I watched him. I literally did not understand a word that came out of his mouth. And it took repetition after repetition before I even started to understand what he was saying. Harley Smith actually thinks that the SIR, the systemic induced response, is beneficial to plant health. He thinks that as soon as a plant starts to create, systemic induced response is like immunity in humans. There's no immunity in plants. It's literally called SIR. So Harley thinks that once SIR occurs, that it actually helps the plant to stay healthy the rest of its life. And if we can somehow or another mitigate the fact that it's combined with the THC production, you know, if we could even come up with a cultivar that, that produces a systemic induced response, but doesn't produce THC, then we're going to be, you know, basically in a watershed moment. Uh, the final thing um, is what I've already mentioned to y'all. If THC limits are raised next year, they say it may be 1.35%, then this problem's largely remediated. There's, there's no way, especially with, with the standard varieties and strains that we have in the industry right now, there's no way that, that anything's going to test hot if we get up to 1.33%. All right, so I'm halfway done, and I think I'm doing okay. I'm a little late. I'm sorry. You're good. So this is all. This is uh, where it gets good. This is what y'all will need if you want to have a, um, a download from Liv uh, by email. Where Liv is. Uh, so these are considered by me, by no one else but me, so y'all y'all can hold me responsible. Good Georgia varietals for biomass. Uh, Super CBD, we've got that out in the field right now. It takes a Christmas tree form, is what everybody talks about in the industry. So the, basically the auxins keep the plant growth up top, down, and the further away the plant is from the top of the plant, the more they grow out. So hence the Christmas tree form, the triangular form. Um, Super CBD is perfect at that. It's the best plant for that form. That's the form that we sold out last year for especially South Georgia. We just didn't know which, which variety it would be. The other good Georgia varietal is cherry wine. Um, cherry wine is actually kind of an offshoot from that guy that claimed that he had the rights to own CBD. But it's um, Bayox is actually, it's an indica variety, so it's not great for Georgia. It's pronounced Bayox, like if an ox lived in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so it's a great variety, but it's also not as great for South Georgia. So if you're growing Bay Ox and you're above Macon, that's probably going to be your strain that you want to try out. Uh, any sativa dominant varieties with the loose open plant structure, the triangle Christmas tree shape, that's what you want for, for good Georgia varietals for biomass. Um, the Sensimia protocol, which again is what I was talking about earlier, seedless versus seeded, uh, we're still going to yank our males this year, I mean, for the most part. Even though I told you that we don't think it affects the CBD content that much, until we know a lot more about it, you know, we're going to yank all of our males. We're not going to, we're not going to leave it up to chance. And also, the males don't make any biomass, so why wouldn't you replace it with a female that's productive? No, no, no male puns intended there. I'm not hacking on males, man. All right, so uh, flower market economical variety, varietals. Uh, I really didn't list any of those that are twelve fifty a plant because I know that I doubt that any of y'all are going to be willing to pay that for it. Somebody's falling. That's not fine. Um, once again, Super CBD, Cherry Wine, Bayox. Those are the big three. They make good biomass and they make good, good flour. Um, the wife is a great variety, but we still, we only have one person, well, we really only had two people plant the wife last year, and it has an unknown origin. Out of all these plants, every single one of them has an origin. They have a mother, a father, a story behind them. Nobody knows where the wife came from. It started out that the people that we were associated, some of the other processors last year were saying that the wife was an offshoot of a T1 or a trunk plant. I know that now basically within reasonable probability not to be true. It has no origin. Nobody knows where it came from. So you don't know whether it's indica or sativa. 
And if you don't know the origin of it, then you technically really don't know what the plant's supposed to look like. So somebody could be selling you something that's called the wife, but it may not be. So the wife, even though it's real good flower, if you can find it, it makes really small buds. They're mostly like the size of a small marble or half of a marble. Um, it's a really good variety for flower market. And I know a lot of y'all, if y'all are going to grow this year, you may be interested in just growing 15 plants instead of, you know, 1,500. So the wife is a good economical choice. Um, the third one is Sour Space Candy. I've actually got some of that out of my truck if, if anybody wants to look at it when I'm done. Um, it, is, it is a weird plant. I, I don't know a lot about its origins. I tried to look them up. I could not find it. Um, but it has an, an unusually sour taste like a Goza beer would. Um, and it's considered by a lot of people to be the best CBD that approaches the THC limit without going over it. So a lot of times it actually does test hot, but when it doesn't, it ends up being the best flower, and it's really a, a much different smell even than what you're used to uh, marijuana smelling like. It's just, it smells like sour, <laughs> hence the name. Super Haze is considered by a lot of people the Rolls Royce of flower, but I would not recommend growing it because it gets attacked by powder and mildew really bad. Um, any kind of indica dominant strains end up being real good for flower. So you've got sativa for biomass and you've got indica for flower um, to, to kind of contrast that. And then anything that's purple or that has the word blueberry in it will sell on the market. So if you're interested in growing flower, if it's purple buds or if it's blueberry and the name of the buds, you're good. Um, Kathy and I have talked about this extensively. Uh, blueberries have L myrcene. Am I? Is it L or or? It's 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 myrcene. We we'll call it myrcene. Um, and a lot of people in the industry claim that the paranoia associated with THC weed is actually caused by myrcene. So a lot of people have actually tested this and found out that if they have high THC strains of marijuana that that don't have myrcene in them, and, and you know, it would take years to even research this, which we can't research it, but these people, the old hats in California, claim that you can have 25% THC in marijuana, and if it doesn't have myrcene in it, they're not going to get paranoid. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm just passing the information along to you. So... And it, and it is a huge problem. If, if people could get around, you know, the anxiety associated with marijuana, it would be a great thing if they could figure it out scientifically. So, uh, this is the big question for y'all growing. I've already told you it's, it's not necessarily a, a big grow that's going to be what you need to do we are going to give you an affidavit if you want to grow with us whether you're growing 10 plants or 10,000 it does not matter we just want you on the team that's all we want and, and and so um the main thing i would say is and i worded this differently on the text and so i'll, I'll read it and then i'll tell you what i mean uh, the first year for a lot of people growing hemp is really their first time forming any crop any plant crop so I would consider it uh, that year that it should be an educational one. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, you really shouldn't invest more than you're willing to lose all of it. So if you've got $1,000 that you want to spend and get an education, then that's what you need to spend. And we can find a way for you all to grow some plants for $1,000 or for $10,000. Uh, last year we grew industrial CBD acreage we had probably i don't know 45 to 55 acres maybe total out of 25 farmers we had one farmer grew uh, 40 acres and then we grew six and a half or seven acres mm -hmm. um and so everybody else was basically an acre or less we had one guy that grew four and a half acres um but everybody else just stopped an acre Last year it ran $11,000 to $17,000 per acre. The main reason why that was was because you had to have it set up like a vegetable field with a plastic uh, mulch or plastic mulching and a drip tape system. Um, and 
by the time you get your well put in, which is generally nowadays anywhere from 5,800 to, you know, eight, nine grand, um, and then you add all the other costs, the $3 a clone on, that's where we come up with that 11K to 17K number. And we did have farmers that formed for maybe a little bit less than that, but, but that's, that's generally what the range was last year. Our target for this year is to hopefully have maybe a 15 to 30% reduction. Um, we've got a way that we can get y'all some seeds if you want them at a much reduced price c compared to clones. Um, so we're, we're, you know, looking forward to hopefully maybe getting everybody's grow in. You know, if we can get them in at 7,000 an acre this year, that'd be great, you know. Um, but then if you're talking about a tenth of an acre, which is 150 plants, 120 plants, you know, seven hundred dollars is something I wouldn't mind losing just to get the education. You know, I mean, it's it's literally it's fun. Um, I listed a couple of the places that are good for looking up horticultural products, especially with relations to to cannabis. Uh, HPS is short for um, this company right here. It's short for horticultural products and services. They actually have a monopoly on all the other vegetable seed magazines in America. It's not a true monopoly, but it's a good one. Roots is in Atlanta. It's a company in Atlanta. They're a little bit more willing to talk to people on a small scale. Atlantis is the big boys. They're in Atlanta, too. Uh, they don't mess around with small grows usually. So if you're going big and you're really wanting to do like a big-time greenhouse, they're good people. Uh, Calyx and Raw is who Harley Smith is affiliated with. So uh, they're out of Oregon. Um, we actually chose Build a Soil last year out of Colorado. They were a little bit more economical, and so they were the ones we chose. We're actually going to probably, as far as I know from what Albert has said, we're going to offer both of these companies as organic options this year. We are about to get there. So... I'm going to say something that I know Paul will maybe, well, Cole says something in direct contrast to it, but I want to clarify what I'm saying. So this is the bottom line. Can you do it? Yes, you can. It's a forgiven plant for the most part. It may be best to start small. Uh, you need to understand if you're growing one acre, you need to spend 15 to 25 hours of labor per week on that one acre. It's a lot of time. Ryan can test for that, I'm sure. Um, if you're going to buy seeds, brown, olive, or black seeds are good. White or green seeds are not viable. So if you get something from somebody, which I did last year, I, they were free, but they were white, and I knew right away they're not good. And they weren't. They didn't sprout. So white or green seeds, you need to ask for your money back. Uh, brown, olive, black, you're good to go. Um, and then I also want to say don't forget about the fiber hemp industry. Um, I don't want to get into that day, but there is some money in that. Uh, I don't know how much it would be. I think right now a good estimate is 8 to 15 cents per pound of fiber stalk, which they call the straw. So this big, huge stalk that's like 12 feet tall is called straw. Um, don't know how that happened, but 8 to 15 cents a pound on straw, you grow 100,000 plants in an acre. So I don't know how to derive that number and, and profit per acre, so I'm not going to attempt it. And then hemp parts. Uh, one of our best farmers, or I should say one of our most intense farmers, they literally did their drip tape and everything by themselves with a little bit of help from me. Um, but they got abandoned by uh, an outside contractor, and so they had to do it themselves. She ate hemp hearts, which are hemp seeds without the shell, uh, for her entire pregnancy. She's probably four foot ten, maybe. Uh, her baby was ten and a half pounds. <laughs> So she blames it on hemp horns. So there is an industry in that. I don't know how to access that industry right now. As a female, we don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no. Do that on the advertisement. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so let's say that y'all are going to be small time growers and you want to grow in pots. Um, this is the industrial standard brand of soilless potting mix, so it's not soil. It's actually peat moss, a little bit of pine bark, vermiculite, and perlite, and then mycorrhizal fungi. 
or fungi, however you want to say it, and then beneficial bacteria, most of which is bacillus. So this is pr premier brand out of Canada. The Canadians own the horticulture industry now. They have a monopoly on it. Premier brand ProMix BX. That's the standard soilless mix that you want to grow any kind of cannabis plant in. It does grow algae a little bit, so you have to, you, you basically have to safeguard the algae. The best way you can do that is hydrogen peroxide, but I'm not going to tell you what concentrations to mix it in because then, you know, it's way less. It, I'll tell you this if you want to use hydrogen peroxide to get rid of your algae in the pro mix, just go ahead and Google it, and you should be able to come up with a reasonable answer. So I'm going to stay out of that. Um, a lot of people, until I went to college the second time, I took five years off to work at Callaway Gardens. Uh, I believe that miracle Grow was literally poisoning. It is not poisoning. The dean of my university, for five weeks, it took him five weeks to convince me that miracle Grow, especially the one that you get in this container, from a horticultural facility is 24-6-17 is the MBK rating. It's considered the ideal plant food for all plants. No matter what you're growing, starting out from seed, that's it right there. Schultz used to make it too, the same complete fertilizer. Schultz is almost out of the business at this point. So they're out of the game. Now I know Claude said when you apply 10-10-10, the plants don't use all of the 10-10-10 and the 10-10-10. And that's true. And so what I would suggest is that we started our plants out at 10% fertilizer rate. So you've got a full fertilizer rate, 100%. All the plants that if y'all go and look in the greenhouse today, they were all started at 10% of that recommendation. I'm now up to 20% now that the plants have gotten bigger. So Claude is right. If you put full strength 10, 10, 10 fertilizer on it, most of that 10, this nitrogen, the first number, is going to wash down the stream and go into the Flint River and be a problem in Florida with algae growing in clear, otherwise perfectly clear rivers. So you really want to guard against that. You know, people in Iowa nowadays are sticklers about it. I mean, they, they do not practice the same thing that Georgia farmers did or do now. They have, they have literally quit tilling up there, and they have quit putting nitrogen and phosphorus in their soil like they used to. And they know it now. They're, Iowans are the first farmers in America that actually realize that nowadays. And now that they do, their, their, their regeneration in their, in their property and, and, and in the whole acreage for the state has, has greatly improved. Um, don't know a lot more behind that, but miracle Grow also has all the micronutrients that you need in it. There's 17 elements that plants need to grow. It's all in that box right there. So, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you feel like you're fixing to fail with whatever you're growing, even if it's house plants, go get you some miracle Grow and grow it and, and put two little scoops instead of one big scoop. That's 20%. So, you know, I, I want y'all to come out of this, if nothing else today, knowing that it's not poison, which I thought for years and years and years that it was just toxic. No heavy metals is a guaranteed analysis, which in the industry, guaranteed analysis means you can bet the bank on it. <laughs> this is the best uh, fungicide, herbicide, not herbicide, fungicide, insecticide, uh, miticide in the industry. It's called Trifecta. So if you had to pick one product, this is it. It's called Trifecta. You have to look up Trifecta spray. I think if you look up Trifecta, otherwise you get like, I don't know, horses or something. But you have to look up Trifecta spray. We're almost there, y'all. About four slides left. Very nice. Let's yes, go. Sir. This is this is where we grow. This is what y'all see later on. Um, we the only thing that we had go wrong this year with the last eight weeks was we had 14 weeks of no sunlight. So y'all will see today that there's about 27 to 34 trays that are really hurting because they sprouted without sunlight, and so basically only 40% of them sprouted. Um, so picture in the plant leaf form. You can't see this. But this is going to be your sativa. It's very tall, very triangle-like. We have a male in the greenhouse right now that looks just like that, so you'll be able to see that. And then this is the other best form in Georgia. It's an indica form, so you can't see this, but it's a bush. It's very round and like a boxwood, but it has sativa leaves. So if you can find an indica form with sativa leaves, 
you're good to go with that too. But we definitely don't recommend growing true indicas in Georgia. We had a lot of problems last year with the T1 trunk plants. They basically started out flying what Tyler within two weeks of putting them in the ground. So stay away from the indicas outside. And and that's 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 it. Um, I I don't know if I can answer y'all's questions or if y'all have any, but I can take a couple of quick ones if you really are pressed to ask me. <laughs> and and uh, Liv, Liv Lonick, uh, I don't know if she has her business card, but y'all email her and she'll give you this speak. Or you can email me. Uh, it's L, L. Rickerson at FatoriFields.com, like Dickerson, like Eric Dickerson. Um, so if you email me, I will get it to y'all. Hey, Lewis, you have a question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, what are the advantages of going inside or outside, depending on um, strains or if, if uh, THC compared to CBD? Right. Um, so I would say... Um, what I told farmers last year was if you had a greenhouse, or are you talking indoors or greenhouse? Greenhouse. So it, I, I told all farmers, we actually made three farmers sign waivers last year that we would not be responsible for their crop plant prices for half of it, which was a state law, if they were below the making state line. And so if they were below, not the making state, the Interstate 80, I-16, if you're below there, don't grow in a greenhouse. It's not a good thing. It, you, it will go hot. Uh, the second thing is, is that um, if you're in a greenhouse, there aren't there are advantages because that's the only thing that flower market really will accept now is indoor greenhouse grown. They don't like outdoor hemp, even though it can be sold. So you've got that. If you're if you're growing for flower, you've got to grow either indoors or in a greenhouse to have a buyer buy from you. At that point, it's got to be at least 15% CBD. Um, but you get the main thing in indoor and greenhouse grow is airflow. And I'm actually fixing to go open up our door right now because of airflow. That is critical to, to stop problems like powdery mildew, septoria, which we just found out about. I didn't even know it existed three months ago. So airflow is your biggest thing. Yes, sir. Um, comparatively, is there a, a market in Georgia for... Uh, CBD plant. Um, you mean for selling the plants, or you mean for the flower? The actual flower. So right now, all I can say, I, 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 know I can answer that. that. Yes. Vague, <laughs> but, but you cannot. Short answer is yes. Okay. Yeah, and but and so the sh the the shorter or a, a sh another short answer is, it is very difficult <laughs> with a lot of words. To sell in, in, within the state from Georgia to Georgia, so. We, we may be able to get somebody to process it in Alabama and bring it back in, but I can't speak to the legislation right now. Uh, all I can tell you is, is this sold at every convenience store in Georgia right now. Manufactured fertilizer, you got the 10 10 10, you're 10% of the 10 10 10, for example. Yeah, so it'd be like a 1 1 1. But if that 10 10 10 is not 100% plant available because of this formulation the way it's made, how do you know what of that 1% of that can you give So, my understanding of it is that calcium, sulfur, and magnesium are the only ones that compete against each other. But in terms of the MPK, um, it's all ready. It's all available right away. And when they say guaranteed analysis... No, it's available to the plant may not be able to recognize it as that formula. Those 10-10-10 or those manufacturing... Right. And, and so my, my answer to that would be if you're giving them what would be considered in the horticulture industry a minuscule amount of fertilizer, they're going to suck it up. And, and, and if they don't need it, they're going to suck it up anyways and put it in basically into their into their vacuole, which is the middle of a plant cell where everything's stored. That's where the calcium is stored too. And so when it runs into a problem like with chitin, all of a sudden the calcium just comes flooding out of the vacuole into the plant. And so it's my experience that plants are hogs. They, they eat more than what they need to. And that's, what I, that's basically what I'm saying. Now, when you get into nitrogen, I understand your point. Phosphorus is not available. It is very hard to make phosphorus available to plants. But nitrogen is quick uptake always. Quick uptake through the root system, right? right. But 
if you can deliver that same amount into a foliar feed, which is an instantaneous plant uptake, and it's basically the plant's going to take what it's going to need. I mean, it's not going to overfill itself. From well, that, that's what I'm saying, though. It will overfill itself. It, it's a hog. Most plants are hogs when it comes to vegetables and herbs. Now, trees may not be, but it's, it's my experience that most plants are, are very piggish when it comes to most nutrients. Outside of phosphorus, you can have certain soil where it won't take phosphorus at all. But to your point, if you do give some plant 20-20-20 or 10-10-10, it's not going to take all that up at once because it's not too much fertilizer for it to kill the plant. But, and, and you remember when we visited, Tyler and I fertilized twice in a row and we didn't realize it, and our plants curled a little bit. That's the first sign. The second sign is death, mm -hmm. you know? So the, the, the answer to your point, or to, to, to your point, 10, 10, 10 at once, a full 100% fertilizer, it really is too much. The, the plant's not going to suffer from it, but it's also not going to take all that up, which was to your point. Um, but when you fertilize at 10 or 20% of that, it's going to suck it right up, you know, unless it's a real, you know, finicky plant or an, an apoxic plant, like a plant that will grow in the swamp, like a um, Venus flytrap, uh, sundew plant, but those kind of pitcher plants. They, they they get all their nutrients from bugs, which is really weird. I, I don't even know how to start talking about that. <laughs> I'm not going to spend an hour talking That's about a that. different lecture. All right, guys. So uh, we're getting closer to the end here. Two more talks. And uh, this is Growing Cannabis and Lessons Learned by Tyler Durantz. And Tyler is our chief agronomist here at Pretoria Fields Farm. We're very proud of him. We had a great year last year and he's going to tell us all about his lessons learned. As Tripp stated, um, I'll be talking about growing cannabis and lessons learned. Um, this was my first year ever growing cannabis and uh, we'll <laughs> and uh, we definitely learned a lot, still learning. In this presentation, we'll be talking about growing hemp for CBD and all the lessons that we have learned in the first year. And this first picture on the left um, is a sprouted seed. Down here on the plastic mulch would be some of our clones that we started. This large Christmas tree was our freak of nature that we found. Uh, it ended up being about seven feet tall after everything was said and done. Um, to the far right will be our cherry wine that did phenomenal. <clears throat> so whenever you want to start growing hemp for CBD, choosing the right place, location, soil type is critical. Um, you want to start off with virgin land if possible. Um, hemp plants will take up anything that's in the soil. If you had herbicide, pesticide, um, heavy metals, anything, it's going to come up into the plant and it'll be in the flower, which you do not want for oil or smokable reasons. Right location is also critical. Hemp does not like to be wet. It needs to be dry. Um, we learned a lot about that. Uh, watering, getting the right schedule dialed in, how much, how long. Um, <clears throat> also the fertilizer is critical. We were lucky enough to have a great company come in and offer their product to us. That turned out very good for the hemp. It took off quickly. On this slide, I have some um, some of the steps that you need to take. First, I would definitely recommend testing your soil, making sure you don't have hard metals, pesticides, any residue in the soil. Make sure it's clean. Like I said, make sure you have good drainage. You're not having 
stagnant water or water just sitting around. Figure out your irrigation schedule, what the plant needs, just look at it. If it's wilting, it needs to be watered. If it's um, if the leaves are starting to curl upward, that means you have too much water and it's trying to get rid of that excess moisture. And um, find a good fertilized schedule. We ended up doing two or three times a week, depending on the plant's needs. Uses for hemp. It's not just CBD, it's not just smokable flour, it's not just seeds. Um, this year we're looking into industrial hemp which we're going to use for fibers. Last year we harvested the entire stalk and we collected that. And right now we're in the process of grinding that up and using it in feeds for chickens, goats, and sheep, uh, possibly cows and horses later on. <clears throat> also the roots. <laughs> we had fun digging up all the roots this year grinding them up and making CBD hemp tea. That so far has been a pretty good seller on the market. There's a lot of cannabinoids in the hemp roots that are good for digestion and inflammation and all around just good for the human body. Harvesting was fun. Um, we planted it in mid-July. I think everything was in the ground by July 13th and we harvested at the beginning of October. We had our guy from the state come in, tested it, tested our uh, hemp, make sure we're not hot. Oh yeah. You didn't have fun? <laughs> um, we harvested the whole entire plant. We just cut it down right above the roots, put it on a trailer, and took it to our drying facility where it stayed for a roughly two weeks, 10 days, until the moisture was right in the bud. And then we plucked the bud from the stem, which is called bucking. And then from there, you can take the bud and give it to your processor, which will turn into CBD oil. Let me ask you a question, so, or just to expand on that a little bit. So harvesting's important. Um, or I guess we were told harvesting was important because why? Well, if you let it go too long, once the bud is mature, and if you let it go too long, it's going to end up going hot. THC is going to go up, CBD is going to go up. Drag it on the ground, you're going to lose all your cannabinoids, all your CBD. Yes, it's a baby. It's pick it, carry it like basket style, like Moses, <laughs> over to the over to the uh, yes. harvester. So. So when you said harvesting was fun, we we took very good care to do harvesting. Yes, and it was quite the process. It took a little over a month to do seven and a half acres, so. Good times. <laughs> <laughs> um, selling your CBD, you can do it as they've stated in previous um, presentations. You can do the oil, you can do smokable flour, you can do the stalks, grind it up. There's a million uses for that. Um, CBD roots, make it into a tea. Um, and that's pretty much the summary of my presentation. I'll be happy to uh, take any questions. What was your uh, biggest hurdle in the drying process? In the drying, keeping the mold off of it, for sure. We definitely had some mold issues um, where the moisture was just too high and too hot. Definitely more airflow. Spacing out um, the stalks as they dry on the line. Any more questions? We did use a couple heaters um, in between the drying lines and then we also had the fans pushing that heat through it so it kept it at a pretty uniform temperature and humidity. Well the bigger the, the bigger the plant. The bigger the plant the more mold you usually get inside on the bud. 
the more spaced out the buds and the leaves were, the better it dried. Hey, Kathy. Yes. For the um, the mold, is it not is it an issue in the extraction process? Well, what is the mold's issue in the extraction well, process? Well, depends on what kind of mold it is. I mean, if it's the mold that's going to create the aflatoxins and autotoxins, then it's an issue in the final process. Um, and also, also depending on what kind of mold it is. I mean, if it's red mold, it's probably not. But we've had some before that's been coated. You also have to think about the people who are working with it and breathing it and that kind of thing, too. Um, but the only ones that really cause a a problem that we know of in the finished product is if it's the ones that causes the aflatoxin. The aspergillus is the main one that causes aflatoxins, and that's the, the kind of death knell when it comes to quality of your finished product. Very good. All right. Very good. Thank you, Tom. Yes, sir. Well, uh, for those of you who have a beer, poop. <laughs> And uh, speaking of poop, I guess this is a double whammy that, um, well, as you can see, I'm using this backdrop because uh, when shit happens, use it as fertilizer and uh, grow from it, right? Um, because it has been quite a few days for me. Um, and you know, everyone usually does thank yous at the end, but uh, I'm going to start off with the thank yous and gratitude and like just... I I have a lot of anxiety. Hi, my name is Liv. But I am definitely, like, happiest and calmest when I am in an attitude of gratitude. And that's how I really feel when I am here at Pretoria. And so I just... I'm, I'm not going to cry sad tears. They're just going to be really happy ones if I do. I'm just leaking from my face with gratitude. Um, but really, like, I don't even know where to start. Maybe, um... Well, uh, honestly, maybe with Tyler and Sierra, uh, because this really, the development of this farm and how it looks and also like the tent and the whole event and even like the setup really like just, uh, thank you that I don't think, uh, Sierra as a support member of the Pretoria team doesn't get enough credit, but also, uh, Tyler, uh, you guys just heard him speak, but also just silent like strong bow to you for putting this all together as well and then well, six and, a half acres last year, all on and that's really like you went above and beyond expectations of taking on this project of a first year project um and then also turning around and being brave enough to speak in front of all these people about that <laughs> um and about like learning experiences and also, like, thank you to Lewis for your presentation, but also going out and talking to all the farmers um, and getting in connection with them and also contacting people or convincing, not convincing them, but, like, comforting them and about believing in hemp because a lot of people have been the monoculture has uh, permeated what the idea of American farming is down here for so long and so honestly that's a big thank you to all of you for being here at a regenerative agricultural symposium um, it's a, it's a step and a start and hopefully uh, also an educational process to be little seeds of inspiration to ripple out an effect and inspire other people to start on this journey with us and guess what Miss Mistakes will be made, <laughs> like buying a 2006 Jetta TDI. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I loved her. I loved her. So uh, broke down last night, and she didn't get in until 11 o'clock last night. So on the interstate, it's only because she's really tired. <laughs> He's being too nice. I'm always insane. Um, but also, like, thank you to Wyndham and Hawk for coming in. Um, so Wyndham's actually one of the brewers at uh, Pretoria. And so thank you for him for coming, pulling through and coming and setting that up. But also thank you to, um, well, uh, uh, Kathy, actually. Kathy Blakey who, uh, if anyone has ever talked to me, I definitely talk about Kathy um, as our Lord and Savior, Kathy Blakey. <laughs> Just kidding. But um, 
so uh, but Kathy has done a phenomenal job of starting a processing hemp lab in Georgia uh, in a industry that gener that generally does not have a lot of information and knowledge out there as well as building a um, building a educational base for other people and turning results back around to help uh, the other farmers as well as product to put into the hands of people. Um, another thank you to uh, Kayla and well Jessica was here earlier for helping with all of this and so Kayla is one of our members of our sales team is also very important in going ahead and educating uh, regular consumers because it's not just about educating people involved in the soil like you said like ground to glass and you know who's holding the glass but customers and pe like people in the economy in society and so Kayla is really an integral part in being able to educate um, the consumer base as well as the retailers to get those products out there and so it really is like the small steps and changes to kind of overtake all um, you know overtake not just like big beer but also monoculture um, and another well another personal thank you to uh, Brad and Sarah here so she was my work wife at Beacon um, my graphic designer labeler social media marketing everything um, her, like soul sister best friend uh, and Brad ended up as the one who saved me on the side of the road <laughs> and uh, made the way down but um, also big thank you to Jennifer because um, like your patient also just first meeting you and the on wonderful conversations keeping me like enthused and energized in this project um, as well as like you are an inspiration for being able to manage so many different aspects it really all like relates back to permaculture guys with like whole systems thinking um, and uh, another thank you to Claude where to Claude. Um, I was so excited the first time that I met him that I actually cried. I was like, wow, wow. And I remember before we went to lunch, Kathy was like, okay, all right, calm down. I was like, I just want to talk about poop. All right, drink, guys. <laughs> I was so excited that I actually forgot to eat and was just, it, it was a phenomenal experience. And, um, but really a huge thank you to Mr. Harris as well as Trip, which um, my husband actually just left back for uh, Germany. And I told Trip the other day, I was like, you know, I'm kind of afraid that uh, Michael might leave me for your dad. But <laughs> I, don't, I left them in charge of putting uh, the camper and uh, like I came back and Michael's just like, Mr. Harris. So I was just like, oh, your new best friend. Um, and speaking of uh, being the best, happy birthday to Mr. Harris. <laughs> Welcome to the surprise birthday party, guys. <laughs> Balloons commence. Um, but also thank you to Trip for having the fortitude as well as like the vision to really be able to take this concept and belief and really make it into something tangible as well as create um, a sp like an actual physical space but also a space in the commercial market for a responsible but a responsible environment ethical um, brewery as well as and then branching out as well as in the um, nutraceutical fields um, and holistic health as well as um, well with the whole farm and so that's like where you lead I will support in the aspect of well all of it but really the regenerative farming um, as well as sustainable agriculture and all of that and I'm also very blessed and lucky that it ties in that a lot of your passions and beliefs tie into ones that I do when I first um, heard of Pretoria uh, was actually when I was a brewer myself at Beacon and their whole farm to table concept. I was I really loved it and when starting Beacon um, I thought that that was actually a seed of inspiration. Pretoria was actually a seed of inspiration for me with Beacon um, because it was a brew pub and so using as many local ingredients from farmers and doing some you know kind of funky shit. Alright it's it's technically poop, so, you know, go ahead. You got us all trained. What? <laughs> That's like that quick. 
Um, but I'm really most thankful for um, just really all the the patience as well as acceptance and like belief that all of these people have had for me and also you guys all your patience it's a lot easier once you're like you know liquored up even though it's uh okay so liquor and brewing is just a uh, false term for it's not as exciting as you would think it just means water so thanks for being hydrated guys uh, but i'm also really thankful for um all of the experience that i've had in the past um that have inspired me intrigued me and actually kept me uh bouncing along the uh, rabbit hole that you know if you've ever had a conversation with me for more than um probably three minutes honestly that that's an overestimate and you're like oh the rabbit hole and i'm like i am the rabbit I'm like, hello come on I dig the hole. <laughs> yeah exactly i dig the hole i make the beer i give it to your one come on so like just thank you guys all for trusting me and um honestly uh Who's to blame for putting a microphone in front of me? <laughs> there, there's that! <laughs> don't worry, I don't need it. I would yell if I had to. <laughs> um, but uh, as he introduced myself, my, uh, so I am Liv. Um, uh, I am Liv. I have a very, in those different experiences that I've had, not just professionally, um, but also personally, have really kind of led me to feel very at home um, and like so connected with this project. And it really starts, I guess, back in, uh, back in old Poland, you know, um, but Poland and Vermont, I was basically, uh, I am an American citizen, so we're just gonna put that out there right now. <laughs> um, but even, <laughs> so, Questions were raised, passports denied, birth certificates questioned, okay. <laughs> and, you know, it also doesn't help when, like, you you have a uh, purple layer one time and I fluctuate my weight a lot, which is part of the reason why poop is so important, because, <laughs> um, and so it's like, agri and it all ties in, I promise. Just, like, stick around for the ride. Seatbelts, everyone, buckle up. <laughs> um, welcome to the shit show, drink. <laughs> Normally, it's on Fridays, though, normally. Um, but, um, so, besides, so, besides professionally, um, my professional experience, my personal experience growing up is that I did not know that I was being groomed for this my whole life. Um, but, however, being raised by, uh, being raised by a Holocaust survivors who uh, believe, like, who, my grandfather's idea of retirement was um, buying a several acre, th a several thousand acre farm in Vermont. And I, I remember being little, like, wow, like so many things. And then, like, doing the math and being like, okay, Bobcha, Jaju, and me. And no tractor at the time. <laughs> and I was like, mm, well, I guess, okay. Um, and so, but it, what it really also taught me, though, was um, I, I did not know and it, until actually I, and so I am very new into um, this whole, like, sub subculture of permaculture, really. So, Ryan, that's, I had a million questions, and I was like, well, better not introduce, like, ah, oh, you know, hey, maybe not right now. Like, the sun needs to set at some point. <laughs> like, um... But, uh, so being introduced to The Biggest Little Farm is a documentary that I really like, uh, kind of, uh, that I actually, when I was talking to Sarah about it, um, recommended, can I, spoiler alert, alright, I don't know how emotionally stable you guys are, but I was not told, Trip, that the dog dies! <laughs> alright! He died a very ha like at the end he of a very so happy, happy healthy life. I was still not prepared because I was like already 19. on I was already on an emotional high from being so uh, for for feeling um, for feeling so connected to something where people have um, been able to basically like verbally tan uh, 
verbally put into words to be able to communicate with other people what I had experienced and what I believe in and like what my idea of traditional farming is. And so that's part of being uh, growing up in Poland and with my grandparents is that is something that I have really struggled with. Um, what is that English is actually not my first language. Um, and so growing up and learning to uh, to overcome barriers of communication um which is why i'm really good at like physical work because you know um and that's uh, actually at the brewery they joke like Liv, she is potato farmer very good at buckets and i'm like well i'm also good at lifting kegs and filling them too but <laughs> uh that's that those are other skills that i got um and so it was, I was already on an emotional high for being given um, a means of vocabulary and a way of explaining to other people or connecting to. It's like that moment where you realize that like other people, like, oh, you're not crazy because other people think or feel or have the same kind of dream. Um, and so that was, and then I was just very excited um, to be like connected, to have that feeling. And then the dog died and I was just like... <laughs> I think I texted you right then and there. I was just like, but you didn't tell. Yes, love the movie. I love the project. Um, Because at this point, I actually had, um, a Trip had contacted me um, about coming back to Pretoria to join a, the farming program as well as connecting it to brewing um, and gave me the documentary as kind of like a frame of reference. And honestly, now I, I maybe I need to like credit you like asterisk footnote, like, the, you know, um, connecting it to ex explain better. The documentary just does a lot better than I do. So, um, and now get ready didn't to watch. Didn't he give you a vocabulary? That's exactly. And so that's one of the things that I really, is this me? Oh, no. <laughs> um, that's one of the things that I really struggled with was being able to like convey to other people, um, my, you know, my dreams, my goals, my beliefs and everything else. And so, I really feel though that I don't have to explain or you know sit here to create extensive analogies to all of you in this room today because I feel like you guys are, are already um, connected with me in the intent and in the desire to go ahead and really support uh, permaculture as well as regenerative agriculture as well as um, you know, just everything i get really excited and i'm gonna point to you in the back there ivan who unfortunately um uh, he was he had i, I don't want to maybe it is unfortunate who knows um he came to pretoria actually to the tasting room um he drove down two and a half hours knowing that we were only going to be open for 15 minutes but he also really strongly believed in um well it, in you know revitalizing the georgia um, economy as well as uh, agriculture and he had the unfortunate uh i was the one that he talked to and so i think it was like 45 minutes later we were talking about like hempcrete and like the evils of monoculture and that and also about um you know all the benefits of hemp not just um not just the effect that it has from the buds themselves for CBD, but also like the plants themselves with bioremediation, um, the fact that you can use the shit, uh, the shiv, that you can actually use for fibers, that you can use things for um, hempcrete, just that there are so many different things that it's an amazing carbon sequester. And just like one plant infects, so is diversified and affects so many different industries in a positive manner that really um i guess the hemp plant is uh would be like the right reverse of permaculture where it's permaculture focuses on like whole systems um versus hemp is like hello i am one little seed rippling out um and affecting in a very positive manner uh the other ways and so it, when I talk about um, being very excited with the vocabulary of learning about permaculture, it really definitely, um, it's, it was reminded me of my first experience of when I got into craft brewing. And so um, craft brewing and farm, uh, farming, not monoculture, well, that's, 
it really they have so many similarities and uh, I really do I'm not always the guy but I know a guy and I think another one of my superpowers is that I am able to um, connect dots between things that people are People are like, oh, well, we're talking about apples and oranges. I'm like, well, they both have seeds and seeds. Oh, well, they both come like this. Um, for being able to find the connections between um, things that, you know, other people might not see. And so for me, it was almost immediate to see the, uh, like, the Venn diagram of craft brewing, uh, craft brewing and permaculture was really less of a less of a Venn and more of just like a pumpkin, you know, like all, all together. Um, and so with, if you really, and then it, I, I started to like work my way back because as a trained chemist, um, I was really thinking, you know, in terms of retrosynthesis, you start at a chemical and work your way back to creation. Um, I was just like, well, I mean, what came first? Honestly, this is the ultimate, and it's not just me. I'm not the only crazy person. There are other people who have published journal articles. There are whole communities fighting about it, okay? That's yeah. <laughs> um, about the, the ultimate chicken or the egg. What came first in terms of forming civilization? Was it fermentation or was it farming and really I think that you know while they can argue the point of like what came first or what started it all I really am excited about like share so excited that I just you know sometimes woo. <laughs> uh, honestly I'm just gonna say poop for the hell of it <laughs> um <clears throat> just so excited about and moving forward and really seeing how we can combine the two symbiotically and synergistically uh, into the culture today moving forward it's that like yeah I mean it's cool to see who was first but I also am known for saying that like other people don't have to lose for me to win so there it doesn't really matter who was first um, as long as we move forward with you know, with helping each other grow and so when well, the more that you think about it too it's not just um, farming um, but it also does and well you know branches out into the all different kinds and again whole systems thinking and if you do go back down the lineage that really um, you know how they say history repeats itself. We are moving away from large culture brewing um, and monoculture back to small craft as well as sustainable agriculture and a permaculture, um, not isolated, but more self-supporting and self-sustaining way. And so if you, if you think about it too, that both of these things, that brewing and farming also um, relied on diversity as well as local ingredients and they all had their own unique fingerprint something that is really known in line but um I'm not that fancy you guys okay like these are overalls like I did not dress up this is my normal this this, this be my normal thing um, but I did style my hair for the event okay <laughs> but in wine as a sommelier would say uh, is that, uh, you know, the flavor depends on the, t where's Claude? I need you for pronunciation. Um, that, that, I want to say terror, but it's not. That, how do you, um, really the whole basis that really connects farming and brewing I really should be better about this, but um, French is not the one of the many languages I know. <laughs> All right, you ready to uh, butcher me in uh, linguistics? Terroir. Terroir? Terroir? Fantastic. Is it? Yeah. But what is it? I said, I gave you multiple options. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it depends on the context of what you're saying. Past tense, present tense, that's all you said. Oh, well. So what, what are you trying, the actual word you're trying to translate to French? T-E-R-R-O-I-R. -R -R. But what is the actual, what are you trying to translate, what are you trying to say in French? I don't think there's a word in English for it. There is not, and so that's another yeah. thing that I'm it really means, glad. It's like the, it's the, it's the idea that the food 
creates gets a um, gets something from the the land that it's grown. Mm -hmm. I mean, that the, the best, the best that analogy is um, is Vidalia onions. And so that where the area that it's grown in has a specific pH, I mean, they have find a bunch of stuff, but who knows if that's the real reason. It could just be that that's the area that it is. But to war is the idea that that if you grow, and this is true with one of the hops that we that we grow, um, for, for one of our beers, the Sholi, uh, we have to get a, a hop, which is a specific breed, from a specific area where it doesn't taste the same. And so it's the, and so that is it's, uh, to me it's a very good example of uh, of what that is. But there's no English word. There's no yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know what I don't know mm -hmm. what the what the, what the and, literal translation. And so just as excited as I was to have um, watched that documentary to give me vocabulary to share some of that, I realized as I ventured more into CBD as well as connecting um, as connecting this idea and concept of farming with farmhouse brewing that there really was a lack of the English word and also a lack of the presence and importance of it in the American and English culture and so um, that's one thing that I really do appreciate to have the opportunities like this with the symposium as well as all of you and to have the opportunity given me by trip to really you know use this site as a place to go ahead and start really incorporating on a on a scientific as well as traditional perspective and so that's one thing in brewing that um also has kind of been i don't want to say like glossed over but you know that's uh american american breweries uh, tend to go on fads and just taste versus um your more traditional your uh and I will say mostly like European brewing um, is done based on local ingredients, local water profiles, local farmers, local everything involved. So it really does become the local beer. Uh, and it's actually, it doesn't mean that it has to stay there. It just means that it was um, a very good product uh, that the farmers, brewers, and as servers were all stewards of the land and they weren't necessarily extracting versus utilizing um, what was given to them to then benefit for the enjoyment of everyone else around. <clears throat> Is that, that's like, I guess the, the, the best way that I can think of it. And so that is, again, another thing that really with brewing um, as it stepped away and same thing with um, with farming is that they realized that this is a process that they could profit on and I am not saying that like profit isn't good but profit's always good because profit allows you to do other things uh, allows you to fuel other good projects and intentions and everything else um, but profit you should never have profit over the people and people is a loose term because a lot of society is out of touch with recognizing that um, a, what an actual person or people to be considered worthy of being um, more than what profit is. And so really people, again, is not a good vocabulary term. And I don't know if there, I haven't found one that really exists in the English language other than the opposite of that is to be a good steward. To be a good steward of the resources that you have. What's that? Well, power <laughs> well evacuate. Bye. Thanks for coming. Yes, and so that's another thing that I really liked about brewing when I first started um, was that one thing I said about brewing and I realized that first from farming is um, that it's honest work meaning that it is very clear if you cut corners if you cut ingredients if you cut quality um, brewing as well as farming really shows in the quality of your products um, what it is as well as how it affects 
the people that consume it. And so that was one thing that, you know, I, politi- I don't want to get too political, but I can't say I'm a true libertarian because I can't trust motherfuckers to, like, <laughs> take care of the environment without some kind of regulation. Yeah. Uh, like, my God, like, that's the only thing that, like, I yes, think. capitalism and profit, but, like, you can't trust people. That's, you know, that's like, you can have all the dollars you, you can have all the dollars you make. But just don't fuck up the way, like, like you know, it's, it, I mean, look at flea markets. Is That's a really good example is that, like, hey, like, have this space and, you know, you can use it and it's up to you to make as much as you want. But, my God, if you leave all your crap. <laughs> Before I go on a tangent, shit. It's going to wash down the river, man. Don't you know that? <laughs> oh, so... That's, um, that was another thing that, like, brewing and farming are both really good examples of honest work. And, you know, they're, act like, requiring you to show up to be your best self, to give your best effort, to do your best work. And so in order to do that, you also have to use what the best is. And then, again, ripple effect out is that you have the best product with the best effects and influence out on the people because that is another thing that I learned as a brewer and as a small little baby farmer in Vermont um, was that it's you exactly what Claude said is that you reap what you sow I was about to start coughing and I was like, COVID is not the time to. <laughs> <clears throat> um, is that you reap what you sow, not in terms of just like product, but also the people that you provide for and what they get as well as give uh, um, back to you as well as put out in there. And so that's um, farming and also brewing are two unique opportunities for someone to go ahead and influence um, to influence the people around them in a positive, healthful manner. And so that's actually how I got tied into nutraceuticals. And that's, um, I don't know if we have enough, thing, you know, I, I don't know if we have enough time for all of that today, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but again, really when I first started brewing, I came down to Georgia from Vermont and I did not realize that I was um, in Vermont with, you know, grow. I had limited farming experience with my grandparents who really had um, the only like, not even small, but they had the only diversified farm amongst their neighbors in Addison County. Our neighbor across the street was actually the largest dairy provider for Cabot Farms. Um, meanwhile, my grandfather had multiple t- multiple different breeds of chickens, of cows, of sheep, of and so I, I mean, I really didn't think of, you know, how we were able to go ahead and raise and manage this farm, just the three of us, um, being able to, that like, well, uh, I'm not, uh, okay, (laughs) I got my driver's license in New Jersey, and I think that I literally just paid for it, Uh, like, I think that's just how they give them out there, um, and I am not much better on a tractor, and my grandfather knew that, and I, if I'm five feet tall now, as an adult, okay, do you know how much shorter I was prepubescent, that was like, I wasn't gonna use a, I wasn't going to use a weed whacker, and so, um, and neither was my grandparents, and so that's where I learned with basically using the resources that you have around you, like, oh, well, uh, you know, you, you have the cows in first, and then you go ahead and have your sheep, and then you have your goats, and then you have your chickens come back through, and it never really occurred to me until I was older in life and experienced I moved down to South Carolina and saw other people's farms and was just like, oh, well, that's weird. Like, you have you have all this for just that? And I'm like, wow, you have a lot of people. Work. You're putting a lot of effort into that. And that was the same way that I felt when I started seeing um, breweries was that, like, wow, you're putting a lot of effort into this for not a lot. I mean, the amount of money in equipment and labor that they put into making a Bud Light versus the ABV that comes out is just not efficient. <laughs> like, exactly. 
Um, and so it really does come back down to quality, and quality really is just an uh, is just a tangible marker of effort put in, and something else that I haven't been able to find in the English vocabulary. But it also is like your soul and your soul connection and your relationship and ownership of being a steward, and so that's that's another thing that I am, I guess very excited about to be part of this project to kind of rejuvenate and um it used to be a lot uh more solid in the craft brewing community um but to really rejuvenate that in and on a more official scientific understandable teachable replicatable um ripple effect way uh of stewardship of the land the resources the actual brewing process, putting out um, good quality products um, of beer that is not just, it's not just about the ABV. It's also about, you know, the nutrients and the nutrients, the vitamins, and the other kinds of phytochemicals. Is that um, I actually, <laughs> welcome to the crazy show, <laughs> caveat is, um, I had learned about a, so I had learned about the dielectric constant in chemistry, which is essentially just a measure of how good something's solubility, a, a solution's ability to dissolve solvents. And this is one thing that I really uh, appreciated and felt connected with, with Claude's project is because it mirrored something that I had a dream for. Um, in 2015, I went to India and I actually did a study abroad at um, IIT Kragapur. And one of the things that I remember students telling me as well as like traveling around was that they have enough land, they have enough product and farm, uh, they have enough food being produced. However, you still have people going hungry because of the lack of in infrastructure and being able to get these products out. Again, it was once colonization happened as well as industrialization and they moved away from homesteads, um, from homesteads and like small local environmental community farming and went to large monoculture for that and so they would literally it was it was honestly sickening and was a, a real eye-opener because I didn't see that in America but we also have ridiculous highway systems and in other states we make people like test for their driver's licenses okay <laughs> like that that's a thing um, but to see all this like <laughs> to, apparently like they one I anyway um but that was to see the amount of food produced that was at such a low nutritional value because it was being so rapidly overturned and then also to go to waste i don't know what i was more angry about the fact that they stripped the land of nutrients that they went ahead and were making these crappy products uh, essentially like low nutrient rice um and then going ahead and putting it in like very dirty shipping containers and just letting them sit and then rot and not even using it for compost like really you just hit me in all like the bad you really hurt me in all the different ways like you you didn't even repurpose it to make grain alcohol out of like you, you know just like so many things um but basically the idea of having um like containers and small i had a weird little dream and about basically making containers and small brew pubs um, disper like dispersed throughout the country in isolated areas that you would be able to grow um, the ingredients that you need, not just for the beer, but also for the food there, uh, in addition to like medicinal herbs and plants. And I realized though, the big connection was not encouraging people to do farming, was encouraging people to do farming with a bonus of a beer. And so I really do think that, um, Trip, you are a visionary and a pioneer in going ahead and like sprouting, uh, sprouting and flourishing the idea of permaculture as well as the return to farmhouse breweries uh, and quality at, in terms of all. Yeah, yeah, that word. We need to come. All right, well, everyone, pass around an index card, and we're gonna come up with a new vocab word. <laughs> um, 
but it real well it really is up to us to go ahead and define what like being a good steward what being a responsible farmer what being an environmentally savvy and responsible agriculturalist or agronomist as well as a brewer as well as a business person as well as a responsible and respected member of the community not just a like LLC or an EIN to be something more than that and to affect to affect people beyond pockets in a community and social and healthful environmental manner and so it really is up to us to to define that um, and push that forward and uh, yeah that's well shit Perfect. that was like yeah. Cheers. Oh, I, got, I got a quick question. Oh, God, go on. So, yeah. No question. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. But yeah, you gotta you gotta convince people with beer. Otherwise, like, how many of you would have showed up if there was no beer? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, in in your professional opinion as brewmaster. Okay, let me stop you right there with Brewmaster, is that um, Brewmaster is another, this is another pet peeve of mine, oh, no. uh, she knows I'm because sorry. I made her strip Brewmaster from all the marketing at Beacon being labeled, so Brewmaster is another um, bastardized American vocabulary That's word. That's what the Australian cannabis is, is that called, that Australian bastard cannabis. That's <laughs> now that she's broken awesome. eyes. Um, so, uh, uh, for a long time, I was the only female brewer in Georgia, and I was the only founding female brewer, and then, um, well, I guess I should start with even before that, I was the youngest. Um, I held that position. No, that is not something to be proud of. That is not something. That is not, like, I don't, I shouldn't. Like, we shouldn't be excited that I was the first. It is two, at that time, it was like 2015. And she knows because the damage control she did for social media and the marketing when someone was like, what is it like to be a female brewer? And I was like, when's the last time you used your dick to match in? Like, I, like I'm sorry to like the, uh, I was just like, uh, what's in my pants? There's nothing. What is in my pants? matters way less to what I do than what is in my heart and how I put that out. And so I was just like, sorry, Yay. but I don't, I don't like the term brew master because right. no one will ever be a master of the yes. brew. I was just wondering the greatest strength is to be like humble and it is a continuous here. improvement <clears throat> process, just as you were saying with like permaculture. <clears throat> and when you're saying that, I was like, <clears throat> I feel that. Oh, sorry. No, 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 you're getting us clear my throat, literally. <laughs> sorry, you're fine. Kathy knows that, like... How nutraceutical is hops as a nutraceutical? That was my question. How nutraceutical? Like, oh, so I can answer that. Hops is actually one of probably, mm. like, the first... Um, I, I don't want to say one of the first, actually, because you have all of the different medicinal herbs in apothecary, but hops is probably one of the first that was really incorporated and used in the well in the beverage industry right. um, because of its antimicrobial preservative effects and that's actually if i have to tell this story one more time about like explaining what like an ipa is is uh because the british were concerned about their beer lasting in india because they didn't have uh, good farming practices to grow their monoculture wheat and barley to make beer um, and so they would actually heavily hop it to act as a preservative effect to so that's go where on. The IPA came. Yep. So, but there's also uh, everybody talks about wine as far as the health benefit because it has something called resveratrol in it. Resveratrol uh, actually inactivates something called NF kappa beta, but NF kappa B. So, and it stimulates stem cells. Well, they found another um, another chemical. There is a chemical in hops. Zymatrol, which does the same thing. So hops actually works very similar to, to wine. So Dr. Lee Lou, as uh, how to eat to beat disease is the reference. Um, I want to actually spend a second and uh, kind of bring all of this together. So.
Pretoria Fields and their um, and our mission is to promote organic farming uh, through sustainable farming measures and and appropriate use of natural resources. And so our mission actually has nothing to do with beer, uh, which allows us to expand, which allows us to expand in a lots of different ways. I mean, we can expand in organic farming. We can expand, and I, a lot of this came with my own personal journey, as a lot of those things do, with health issues and worrying about and dealing with different health issues. And I feel uh, that a lot of our, I don't feel, I think it's good science that a lot of our health issues are, are put on to us by what we eat right now. Um, babies, the CDC study shows babies that are born today have 136 chemicals that they wouldn't have, you know, they wouldn't just normally have in, in there. A lot of those are organophosphates. Uh, everybody has a glyphosate, glyphosate level, um, which is Roundup. I mean, it's just, you know, we, we have an unnatural assortment of chemicals that are associated with us that lead a lot in terms to autoimmunity and cancer and a lot of chronic disease that we deal with, um, deal with today. So the first talk, Gordon Rogers, um, he, he talked a lot about our water, well actually didn't talk a lot about water utilization, which is what I thought he was going to talk about, but he talked about how energy utilization actually um, pertains to water utilization. Um, and permaculture affects that way because a good permaculture farm and a non-monoculture actually acts as a sponge and not a sieve. So, so, you, so you don't have the large volume, um, large volume irrigation that pushes water out and then immediately goes into the rivers and then it's gone. I mean, it's actually stored in the environment and then it's slow, slow released over time. <clears throat> permaculture itself, I think is a language that I'm just beginning to learn from a crazy movie that I watched because somebody told me to watch it, and which is awesome because it was something that we were actually trying to do when we didn't even know we were trying to do it. Uh, then True Earth and this, uh, this association, um, well, number one, he's led us to permaculture and to the idea of regenerative agriculture. Number two, uh, he talks the talk and walks the walk. I mean, if Claude tells you something, it's going to happen. Like, he will do everything he can to make it happen. And so I'll do everything in my world to, to work with people that are, are like that. <clears throat> the second half of the discussion was basically my team. And so started with Lewis. And I, Lewis worked at um, uh, oh, the farm. Oh, yeah. Say it again. Yeah, but Will Harris, Will Harris and... And White Oak Pastures is uh, regenerative farming. And so they're the leader in regenerative farming in the southeastern United States. I mean, they do it through animal agriculture, but they have um, have taken a lot of these processes like to the nth degree and are teaching people. So our next marketing sales slash sales meeting next month is actually at White Oak Pastures to try to teach our team what we're trying to teach everybody who drinks one of our products. I mean, our goal is to educate people through the products that we sell. Um, Second's Tyler. Tyler is boots on the ground, baby. Tyler's boots on the ground. Tyler's here doing doing the work uh, that I'm only sitting here talking about. Because although I come, I came out and I, I think I, when I said fun harvesting, I came out and helped harvest it, and that was hard work. So every day uh, he's here leading the team. Uh, I don't know, any, anywhere from just Harris, my dad, to, <laughs> to 10 to 15 other people on what, you know, on what we're doing that day. So uh, kudos to him. And the newest member of our team is Liv. Um, Liv is brilliant, and she understands our, what the concept of what we're trying to do. She has now worked, I think, in every different facet of our organization. She's brewed. Uh, she's extracted and now she's on the farm and she's going to get our farmhouse brewery going. So all of those things combined, and that's the reason the speakers made sense. So I hope, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, I don't really have, I guess that kind of breeds it up. I don't really have anything else to add. Thank you all for staying.
if there's any questions, I made all the speakers come back in. So if you'll have any questions about agriculture or, or our farming process or what we'll do in the future, then please ask now. And I appreciate everybody's attendance. So thank you. Claude, you always have something to say. <laughs>